front by various colleagues from my team, from the DWF. So I have to my right Rebecca Harris, who's a solicitor in, um, in the employment team at DWF. And to my left, uh, immediate left, Sarah Morgan, who is a director in the employment team at DWF. And beyond them, on each side, Siobhan Hammond, uh, who's an HR business partner with Fusion, and Lucy Hutton, who's also an HR business partner with Fusion. Um, we're going, to, we're going to be running a mock tribunal, so um, we're not particularly actory, so I, whilst I will get in character in a second, I don't have to go through any process or breathing exercise or anything like that. There are a couple of things that, um, that uh, you, you're compulsorily obliged to say at the start of these things for no other reason than um, everybody does it. So the toilets are immediately out of the door on the left hand side if you need them, but they're really cold. Um, whereas this room is lovely and warm, so I'd only go there if you really, really need to. There's no fire drill, there's no fire drill scheduled, so if the alarm goes off, we go straight back out the door that everybody came in and we walk up to the top car park. We have got a break scheduled, uh, which is at approximately 11.30, 11.40, where you can recharge your teas and coffees, etc. And I understand there's food coming at half past 12 when we finish. Um, you will have a chance to ask questions at the end. Ordinarily, when we're presenting, we say ask them as we go along. Because we're doing it as a mock tribunal, if you wouldn't mind saving questions for the end, we will give you a chance to ask, why didn't you ask this? Why did you do that? If you want, I'll give you a chance to cross-examine the witnesses, if you wish to do so, which they will obviously relish. Um, particularly Siobhan, go for it, Gina, start jotting them down. Um, um, and you can, also, you, you can also, if you want, ask questions of the advocates. They will happily explain why, for instance, they didn't ask a certain question, why they didn't pursue a certain line of questioning, why perhaps they didn't call other witnesses. Um, so again, we're happy to take those questions, and we've, we've allocated a decent amount of time at the end. Um, likewise, if you want to ask any other questions about the, the mock tribunal process, <coughs> we'll try and explain how it differs from a real-life tribunal. Um, we've tried to make it as realistic as possible, but you'll appreciate we have to take some form of poetic license, otherwise you'd all be sat here for a full day, you wouldn't really be able to hear us because they'd be facing me, etc. So there are various things we've taken liberties with, but we try to keep the process as near as we possibly can to a real-life tribunal process, right down to the case which is sort of a mishmash of two or three different real-life cases. The example we're using is an academy school. The reason we're using an academy school is because there were a multitude of different businesses coming. I asked Billy what sector you were from, and he listed about seven. Um, a school was the easiest way that we thought we could transpose everything, because most people know what school's like. Most of you will have been to one at some stage. Um, we'll have children at one, etc. And you will also understand why when we put a, an element of um, protection in there, you'll understand particularly why it's important for schools. So it was a very easy real life example. Um, but again, got any questions on it, shout them at the end and we can explain how it would differ perhaps in a different sort of business. Does anyone want to ask anything before we start? <coughs> well, good morning everyone. Thank you for attending the, uh, thank you for coming into the tribunal this morning and being so punctual. Um, representing the claimant this morning, I have Miss Harris, is that right? Yes, sir. Thank you, Miss Harris. Uh, you're a solicitor? I am, sir. Excellent, thank you. I'll, I'll come back in a second. And Miss Morgan for the respondent. Yes, sir. Is that right? Excellent. Um, Miss Harris, I believe you're calling one witness? Yes, sir, just the claimant. Just the claimant, very good. And Miss Morgan, yes. one witness as well? One witness, sir. Thank you. Now, I have in front of me a bundle of documents. Hopefully, you've all got it too. Um, I have in front of me a bundle of documents. Is this an agreed bundle between the parties, both of you? It is a joint bundle, sir. Excellent, that's always useful, thank you. Um, and if I draw the front page, which looks like an agenda, uh, it appears to be indexed. Um, and we've got pay I've got pages in front of me from 1 through to 30. Yes, sir. I'm lying. It's 1 through to 29. Apologies. OK, fair enough. Uh, yes, sir. 1 through to 29. And behind that on a tab, I have two statements. Who are your two witnesses? So for the claimants, I have the statement at the back of Ms. Jackson. <coughs> That's your statement, Ms. Jackson. And Mr. Dusak. Ignoring the obvious Yorkshire joke of Mr. Ah Dusak. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> right, very good. Before we start, um, may I just clarify the issues? And I'm going to take a moment uh, to read through the claim form and the response form because I haven't done so yet. I haven't had the opportunity. Um, but I can see that there's been a preliminary hearing, and I can see that it appears that the issues. Um, were discussed. So I think we are looking at purely, or well, we are looking at an unfair dismissal claim, is that right? Yes, sir, but we're also looking at a subsequent notice pay claim as well, sir, as an additional matter. 
So a breach of contract claim for the notice period only. Yes. Okay, that would follow. Um, and in terms of the dismissal, we're looking at, I'm going to have to determine the principal reason for the dismissal of the claimant. Yes, sir. The respondent presumably is going to say misconduct. It is, sir. Are you pleading the alternative this morning? <coughs> no. Yeah. So it's purely misconduct. Um, does the claimant concede, Ms. Harris, that this that the claimant was dismissed by reason of misconduct? Uh, yes, sir, but um, obviously it's disputed as to whether or not the reason was misconduct. Or of whether course. it was misconduct. Of course, and I appreciate that, Ms. Harris. So um, so ultimately we then the second part of the test that I'd be looking at is what we would tend to call the virtual test. So whether or not the respondent held a genuine belief based on reasonable grounds and following as much investigation as, as I deem reasonable. Um, and then ultimately whether or not dismissal fell within a band of reasonable responses. Again, I can't substitute my own view for that of Mr. Mr. Dusak in this case. Are you both agreeable that those are the issues that I have to determine this morning? We are, sir. Very good. Well, that's very helpful. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm going to take a couple of minutes. And I'm going to take a couple of minutes. I'm going to read the claim form, which is at pages... Two through to eight in the bundle, but in reality, that is only pages seven and eight. <coughs> the rest of it's a pretty dull form. So if, if I and everyone else reads pages seven to eight and pages 14 to 15 of the bundle, that will give the background to the case, what the respondent's position is and what the claimant's position is. So I'm going to take two minutes to do that now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, I've had a chance to read through both of those documents. Um, they're very useful in the <coughs> issues. Um, so bearing in mind that the respondent concedes that it dismissed the claimant, the first burden, technically speaking, Ms Morgan, is on the respondent. Um, would you would you like to call it, unless there are any further matters as preliminary matters? No? Would you like to call your first witness then, Ms Morgan? So I'll call Mr Dusak. Mr Dusak, thank you. And I can see from my note, Mr. Dusak, that you um, you wish to affirm, is that right? You're giving your evidence of affirmation. Yes, please. Okay. Would you just repeat after me, please? Um, I do solemnly and sincerely affirm. I do solemnly and sincerely affirm. That the evidence I shall give to the tribunal. The evidence I shall give to the tribunal. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. Truth. And nothing but truth. Thank you. Um, so, Mr. Dusak, after the divider in the folder, there's a statement that bears your name. Yes. Is that right? Signed by your date of the 15th of November. Is that your evidence to this tribunal? Yes. Is there anything within there that you wish to change or amend at this time before no, it's submitted in evidence? No. Okay. Again, I'm going to have to take a couple of minutes just to read through this, Mr. Dusak, if that's all right, before, um, before I attend the, the, the cross examination. Will you have any additional questions to ask of Mr. Dusak, Ms. Morgan? No, sir, though of course I deserve the right to re examine. Of course, no, I, I, I hope you wouldn't bear in mind it was only exchanged a fortnight ago, but yes, of course you, you do have the right. Um, okay, if you can give me two minutes, Mr. Dusak, <coughs> I'll read through this. Through Mr. Dusak's evidence. Um, before I turn to Mr. Dusak for cross examination, um, could I just make clear to both advocates, I'm only going to review pages in the document that I'm specifically referred to. So if you do want me to consider a document, you are going to have to. Point that document to a witness or allow to it specifically. Is that okay? <coughs> yes, sir. There are quite a lot of documents. Okay, thank you very much. Ms. Harris. Yes, sir. Um, good morning, Mr. Desac. Um, I have a few questions for you. Um, let's start at the beginning, shall we? You've been the head teacher of Shady, Shady Academy for 13 years, that's correct, isn't it? Yes. Um, and prior to that appointment, what was it that you did? I was a deputy at an independent secondary school based in Hertfordshire and I held that position for five years. So you would say you have extensive experience in this field and have dealt with various employment issues during that time, I imagine. Yes, I have. So although you're the head teacher of Shady Academy, um, just to confirm, you are still an employee of the school, that's right, isn't it? Yes. Yes. So you report to the governors? Yes, that's right. And you employed the claimant here, Miss Jackson, 13 years ago, that's right, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. And I understand you've been happy and impressed pretty much with her work throughout her period at the school? Oh yes, I suppose so. So has she ever been subject to any disciplinary actions, Mr. Desai? No. So the first issue would be the issue um, in relation to Ms. Jackson that surrounds the facts of this tribunal case. Yes, that's right, but it was very serious. But a blip in an otherwise exemplary record. A very regrettable one. So, in your witness statement, which we've just read, Mr. Desai, you say that your IT manager, Mr. Bug, 
told you that there was a lot of email traffic coming through the server. Following his concerns, we asked him to carry out a thorough check of the email traffic to ascertain where this increased flow had come from. That's right, isn't it? Yes. So, Mr. Bug, he told you that this increased email traffic was being generated from my client's account, is that right? That's right. So, you told him to do a thorough check of her email and internet use? Yes, I wanted to know why she was using our email system so much. But you didn't, though, ask him to do a thorough check of all the staff's uh, email and internet use, did you? Oh, no. Barbara had been identified, you know, as a culprit, and so I saw no need to check up on any other employee. I see. So um, let's just have a look at what it is that gives the Academy the right to access and review employees' email and internet use. What is that, Mr. Sir? The Academy has a computing policy which allows us to monitor emails and internet usage. Thank you, Mr. Sir. So um, these, the policy that uh, Mr. Sir refers to is actually at page 5 to 11 of the bundle. I won't ask you to read the whole policy, sir, but um, I will be looking to refer to two particular sections. Um, <clears throat> if I take you to page 6, sir. Um, the first section I'll be um, referring to is paragraph 122. It's signed by Mr. Bug, but not by the employee, is that right? That is right, sir. Okay. Yes. okay. Sorry, yes. page 6, you said. Page 6, sir. I'll be referring to the 122 at the top. Okay, thank you. So, um, that, sir, it says that a reasonable amount of personal internet access is permitted during your authorised break periods and before and after work. And I'll also be referring Mr. Um, Desac to the bottom paragraph, sir, 134, where it states you're permitted to use your work email address to send and receive personal messages, provided these are reasonable in number, length and frequency, and personal email should be clearly described as personal on the subject line. Okay, thank you. If you give me a second, Ms. Harris, I'm just going to make a note. I suspect Ms. Morgan, you're going to be referring me to different elements of this policy. Indeed, sir. And sir, so I will be referring to page 11, as you just mentioned as well later on. Okay, thank you. Ms. Ms. Harris, is it your client's position that she didn't accept this policy? It is, sir, yes. Okay, but by the same token, you wish to point out issues relating to it to Mr. Dusak in any event? Yes, sir, because um, as you will see, um, it will be the uh, claimant's position that Mr. Dusak is also subject to this policy. Okay, so in the event that I find that it is binding on her, that's your alternate position? Yes. Okay, let me make a note. Mr. Sachs, so we've just looked at paragraph 122 and 134. Um, at these paragraphs, it's confirmed that employees are permitted to have personal internet access and also to send and receive personal, in, uh, personal messages. You'd agree with that, wouldn't you? Yes. So, with regards to personal internet access, this should be reasonable in amount and during authorised break periods before and after work. That's right, isn't it? Yes. Um, so when was it that the claimant accessed the internet for her personal use? I think it was outside teaching hours. Yep, that is confirmed in the email from Mr. Bug to you, which was dated the 29th of January last year, at page 16 of the bundle. So, um, I don't know if you've seen this uh, uh, page um, as of yet, so if you'd like to I have a, with it, sir. Would you mind giving me a second, Ms. Harris? Thank you. I can see in the middle of the page the majority of the emails are sent either first thing in the morning or after 5 pm. Yes. There is an occasional email which is sent midday. Yes, sir. Which, again, I'm I'm presuming that your client's position is that would be reasonable personal if it's an occasional one. Okay. And it's relevant what time she was actually using this internet. Thank you. Okay. If you just give me a second just to read through the rest of this so that I can mark it as read. Thank you. This is the email that you're referring to as, as the investigation from Mr. Bug. Is that right? The summary of the investigation. Thank you. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, <clears throat> now, Mr. Desac, I, I will return you to the question of whether this is a reasonable amount of personal internet access. Um, so, what would you say constitutes reasonable? Well, it's not five times the amount of everybody else. But, but you have said, which we've read today, Mr. Desac, in our paragraph eight of your witness statement, that so long as the work comes first, you don't really have a problem. So, Ms. Jackson continued to work as she always had, and you had no reason to believe that her work didn't come first, did you? Well, yes, but as I said, that doesn't mean that people can go downloading pornography. Well, we will come to that shortly, Mr. Desac. If I could take you back to page six of the bundle and the second paragraph of the policy that I referred to earlier, which is page six and paragraph one to three, four, which deals with reasonable number and frequency. So, 
As I said, it says it's th they're reasonable in number, length, and frequency. So, Mr. Desac, you've actually said in your written statement that Ms. Jackson sent and received over 20 emails a day, which were marked private or personal. So, this is confirmed in the email that we've just looked at from Mr. Berg. So, do you consider this to be unreasonable? Yes, it was five times more than the average team member. But did you look at how much time the other team members were actually using the internet for personal use? No. Why not? I didn't think it was relevant. Mr. Bug told me that Barbara was the one sending pornographic emails. But you have stated that you determined Ms. Jackson's personal email use was actually unreasonable in comparison to her colleagues. So have you read these emails? No. Um, is it possible? that Ms. Jackson's emails were actually just two lines long and maybe only took a couple of minutes to write. Well, it's possible, but 20 a day is just simply too many. But you don't know because you didn't check. I don't, don't know how much time. Well, it's possible that her colleagues spent more time surfing the internet for personal reasons and sending Facebook messages to their family and friends, for example. Would you not say that? I just don't know how much time everyone else spends on the internet. Mr. Bug produced a report and it was really clear that the increased usage was down to Barbara. Ms. Harris, right? Yes. You've made a very good point and I have it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. To conclude on this point then, Mr. Sack, you're unable to really say whether these personal messages were reasonable and then they were It wasn't the focus of the investigation. But you just took Mr. Bug's word for it, didn't you? I suppose so, but I'm not sure I'd, I'd put it quite like that. I relied on my IT manager's report, which in my mind is completely reasonable. Okay, well, Mr. Desac, you have referred in your witness statement that you acknowledge that any private and personal emails were marked as such. So, Ms. Jackson was clearly differentiating those emails from public view and those that were personal and private to her and whoever she was sending them to and from. So to your knowledge, has she sent any of these private or personal emails to the rest of the staff? No, but we, we are able to look at a monitor personal email. Okay, well if I can take you to paragraph 142 of the IT policy. So that is at page 8 of the bundle, halfway down. I'll be reading it out, sir, for your Thank you. Anyway. Okay. Um, thank you. It says here, by signing the policy, you consent to the Academy monitoring your email and internet use, including the examination of the content of any personal email sent or received by you. Can I ask you to go on to a few pages to paragraph 11? And I think um, you've referred to this already, sir. But Mr. Desac, could you tell me if you notice anything about page 11? Uh, yes, it's not signed by Barbara. No, that's right. So Ms. Jackson hasn't actually consented to you monitoring her emails, has she? And in fact, she stated in her disciplinary hearing that she hadn't signed it and that she, she hadn't seen it before. So, Sarah, I don't know if you've seen this, the notes of this hearing, but it's actually at page 24 of the bundle, if, if you would like to have a quick look. Well, page 22. I, I haven't yet, but does the witness, Mr. Dusak, is that correct? Did she raise it in the disciplinary hearing? That's fine. Okay. Thank you. Do you have any reason to doubt that Ms. Jackson hasn't seen it or signed this policy before, Mr. Dusak? Well, I know that it was sent to her. She should have read it. But that doesn't necessarily mean she actually read this policy, does it? Indeed, she she hasn't. She clearly hasn't signed it. So, did she make make it a habit of flouting all of these academy rules? Well, not until now. Well, in any event, so paragraph one four three of the um, IT policy, which we've looked at just now, in the back at page eight. The academy states it respects the employee's privacy with regard to the contents of personal emails sent and received. What do you think that means? That it won't divulge the contents of any such emails to others. Well, let's attend to, to the point that you've raised about the inappropriate content of her email, shall we, Mr. Sack? So, paragraph 7 of the computer use policy deals with misuse of the Academy's computer system. So, I'd like to refer you to paragraph 1723, which you will find on page 10 of the bundle. And Mr. Sack, this particular paragraph here refers to deliberately accessing material of an indecent, obscene, pornographic, or otherwise similarly inappropriate nature. So, have you actually had a look at the website hankyhubs.com? No. Oh, why would I look at a site like that? It would hardly be appropriate, would it? Well, at paragraph 11 of your witness statement, you refer to it being a dating site, I believe. So, how do you know that it's indecent, obscene, or indeed pornographic? Oh, 
Well, it doesn't really sound particularly innocent, does it? But you're unable to confirm whether it really is pornographic, obscene, or indeed, I think, filthy, as you've described it in your witness statement. The website sometimes shows images of naked men, and some of Barbara's email attachments contain similar images. What more do I need to know? It's clearly completely inappropriate in a working environment. So have you seen these attachments? No, I'm just going on what Ian told me. I don't need to see something to know that it's inappropriate. So you took Ian's word over Mr Jackson's word? No, that's not what I was saying. Well, let's have a look then. Do you, would you say that Michael, Michael Andrews Davids, for example, is pornographic? It's very different. That's art, it's a sculpture. But the point is, Mr Lissac, that nudity doesn't necessarily equate to pornography, obscenity, or in fact filth, as you've referred to it. Would you agree? I suppose in certain circumstances, but I don't think anyone here is under any misapprehension that Hunky Hunks is an art website. Well, Mr Lissac, you've not seen the images complained of, so how can you determine what their nature is? Well, I've already answered this. You also refer, Mr. Lizak, in your witness statement <coughs> to a video clip of Miss Jackson in provocative underwear. Did you see this video clip? No. Well, how do you know it's provocative? That's what Ian told me. I mean, she's in her underwear. Well, you did put this point to Miss Jackson at the disciplinary hearing, and I believe she stated that she did not believe the underwear to be provocative. I believe so. And you've said in your witness statement again, Mr. Lissac, that when questioned about the video, she stated a colleague had passed images of herself um, wearing only a bikini around the office. Is that right? Well, that's what Barbara said, but I've not seen those holiday photos either. Well, have you made any inquiries as to these particular bikini photos which have been distributed? No. So you don't know whether the bikini shots that were passed around by another colleague were more or indeed less provocative than the underwear of Miss Jackson's video? Well, I think a swimsuit is meant to be worn, you know, seen in public, and underwear is meant to be kept to yourself. Yes, and Miss Jackson did mark the emails containing that video as private, didn't she? So I understand. So do you think you may have jumped to some conclusions here, Mr. Sack? So I don't know what you mean. Well, from what, told, from what you've told us, you've carried out no real investigation whatsoever. You've not um, accessed or monitored any other employees' email or internet use. You might have found other employees who had been using their computers for sending personal emails of a similar nature, or indeed a nature that did in fact breach the computer use policy. That's possible, isn't it? Well, yes, I suppose so, but I was just dealing with the matter in hand. Well, when you look at it like this, you've not actually carried out any investigation. Mr. Bugger produced the report, and Barbara held her hands up to the allegations, so I didn't see any need for further well, investigation. Well, well, let's have a look into that, shall we? How much notice did you actually give? Miss Jackson before calling her into the first meeting on the 29th of January. I'm sorry, I don't recall. Well, um, sir, I don't believe you've seen this email, but it's at page 18 of the bundle, if I could take you there. This is the email inviting the claimant to the first meeting. To an investigatory meeting rather than the discipline? Yes, sir. Yes, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, yes, I've, I've read that. Um, entitled <coughs> meeting now, isn't it, Mr. Lissac? Um, so, no notice whatsoever. I suppose so, but it was very serious. I needed to speak about it immediately. Did you tell her what the meeting was about? No. And she had no idea what the allegations that she was going to face were, was she? No, but I'm not sure why that's relevant. I thought it would be better to discuss the matter face to face. Well, we do have the meeting notes of, of this particular first investigatory meeting. Um, and it's page 19 of the bundle, so it's a relatively brief document if you'd like to have a quick look. Thank you. 19. <coughs> yes, sir. Yes, I've read 19. Uh, I've just turned the page as well. It's a 20. Confirmation of suspension. And yes, sir. Invite. I, I, sorry, I, I suspect you're getting on to that. Uh, yes, sir, although I won't be specifically referring to um, that particular document. I don't mind. Okay. Maybe. Thank you. Mr. De Sack, as you'll see from these meeting notes of the first investigatory meeting, um, Barbara admits that some of the men that she dated did send photos of themselves and she viewed them on her work computer. She also admits that she had access to adult websites and made a video as a birthday present for her boyfriend. So she insisted that it was a bit of fun between two consenting adults and didn't harm anyone. So at what point does she admit that such correspondence was of an indecent nature? Well, she doesn't, but I think it's implied. Does she admit to looking at pornography? Um, maybe not in those, in those words, but she admitted to the allegations. And Miss Jackson uh, maintains her version of events at the disciplinary hearing. Um, she viewed her actions as chatting with other consenting adults and did not consider this to be porn. 
Well, then, given that it seems to be some discrepancy between what you've told, uh, what Mr. Bugs told you, and also by what Ms. Jackson has told you, would it not have been prudent for you to have carried out an investigation into the contents of the email, the photos, the video, the website? Mr. Bug told me all I needed to know. Then why didn't you carry out an investigation? Because I didn't think it was necessary at the time. Well, you yourself have said in your witness statement that you've placed a large amount of significance on the delivery from Anne Summers to Miss Jackson. You say that the order contained adult items, I believe. Did you see what had been ordered from Anne Summers? No. Well, how do you know they contained adult items? Well, everyone knows what kind of things Anne Summers provide. Well, at paragraph 18 of your witness statement, you've said that you couldn't let the Academy be associated with pornographic images, websites, and Anne Summers toys. It's a bit of a jump, isn't it, Mr. Sack? In what way? Well, given that you've not seen the images or been on the website or seen what was ordered. I was going on my interpretation. Well, did you ask Miss Summers what she'd ordered from Anne Summers? Miss Jackson? Uh, I don't Sorry. Know. <laughs> Apologies, sir. <laughs> Miscommunication for names, yes. sir. Um, let me take page. <laughs> <laughs> let me take you to page twenty-three of the bundle, please, Mr. Desaf. These are the disciplinary hearing notes. So I don't know whether you wish to read um, all of the disciplinary hearing notes from twenty-two to twenty-four. I, think um, I will be referring to some particular sections, but it may be worthwhile reading it. Can I have a look at it first? And uh, because I suspect as well, Miss Morgan will be referring to. Yeah. Yes, sir. I, I, so I would ask you to look at it rather than us picking out. Thank you. I'll look at it in the round if I may. 22 to 24 before letting you carry on. Okay, thank you. I've read through those minutes in full. Uh, there are, there's, there are certain elements now we're going to. Yes, sir. I, I could just bring your attention to the bottom of page 23 in the okay. last box. Mr. Sack, I'll be referring here to the bottom um, there where it says even if she's opened the parcel, she would have seen it with some tasteful underwear. So it explains clearly here that she just had some tasteful underwear, isn't it? Well, in, in any event, she shouldn't have been having parcels delivered to work. And that is in line with our employment handbook. Um, so at this point, we don't have a copy in the double of the particular policy that Mr. Sack referred to, but there is a quote, as you'll see, the uh, fourth box up from the bottom on page 23. Um, this is an agreed policy with my friend. Um, and I'd just like to make reference to that particular section, Mr. Sack, where it says employees must not arrange for personal items such as post and or parcels to be delivered to the academy's office address without the express written consent of the head teacher. Ms Jackson was unaware of this policy, was she? Well, that's what she said. Well, do other members of staff have items to deliver to the Academy without your consent? I, w I don't know. Well, in the disciplinary hearing that we've just read, Tracy Weller confirmed that she did get parcels delivered to work and had not asked you for permission. That's right, isn't it? Yes, that's So you do know, and yet this formed part of the reason for dismissing Ms Jackson, even though other employees did exactly the same thing that she did. Is that a question? I'll rephrase that, Mr. Sack. Like, did the personal delivery form part of your reason for dismissing Ms. Jackson? Only insofar as it formed part of a pattern of behaviour as, as it was from an adult store. Again, Mr. Sack, like, you seem to have failed to conduct any form of investigation. That would, that would be correct, wouldn't it? It was an answer, Ms. Package. Well, moving on, Mr. Sack, like, did anyone know about or was anyone concerned with Ms. Jackson's use of her computer or emails prior to you accessing her private correspondence? Not that I'm aware of them. So you've not received any complaints at all from parents or Rosto, for example? No. So who does Miss Jackson, um, who, or who is it actually that knows about Miss Jackson's internet activities? Myself and Mr. Bug. And I know that you were concerned that Miss Jackson had set up her Hanky House account using her work email address and that it should have had an, in, an adverse impact really on the academy and bring it into disrepute. Yeah, I thought it was disgraceful. But, but the email itself was only ever visible to the administrator of the site and it wasn't publicly available. So you've just confirmed, haven't you, that Mr. Bur only Mr. Bug and yourself knew about this, and you monitored Ms. Jackson's private and personal emails and internet use. You've not received any complaints, though. No, but that's not the point. All the emails were sent from our address, which IDs it as coming from Shady Academy. Well, if I could return you to the comments that you made in your uh, witness statement, I believe it was paragraph 22, and you've referred to a joke email and a postcard that you sent last on holiday. If we could have a look at these, sir, uh, these are at pages 13 to 15 of the government book. Thank you, sir. Mr. Sack, what, was, what would you say about the contents of this email? It's just a bit of banter. Well, could you just, for the sake of the tribunal, mind reading out the subject of the email which you sent? Yes. Yeah. Sexist jokes against women, but very funny. 
And would you mind just reading out the first example for the chart being on the stick sack? How do you turn a fox into an elephant? Marry it! And how exactly is that funny, Mr. Dessert? It's just a bit of banter. Of course it sounds odd out of context. And what context should that have been ready? Well, work can't be all serious. There is just a, you know, just a few jokes. You're trying to make this email much more serious than it is. And I suppose this joke is suggesting that once women are married, they let themselves go. It's just a joke. It's not like pornography. <sighs> what should you give a woman who has everything, a man to show her how to work it? Do you agree that this suggests that women are incapable of actually doing things for themselves and require a man to help them? It's just a silly joke. Miss Harry's like, yeah, again, I've got the point. Thank, Thank you, sir. Missy de Sack, would you agree that these comments would be deemed offensive? Well, no one at work complained. It was just a bit of banter. A bit like no one complained about Miss Jackson's personal email. It's just different, they were pornographic. But your sexist <coughs> jokes were sexist. Yes, but it was a joke. I make similar jokes about men. Well, Missy de Sack, if I could refer you to page 10 of the bundle, and this is the IT policy. And I'm going to refer to paragraph 1.7 uh, here. And the Academy regards a serious misuse of its computer systems as gross misconduct, um, which could result in your summary dismissal. An example of serious misuse includes making a sexist or similarly inappropriate statement. So do you think your email could fall under this? Well, Hadley, it's just a bit of banter you're using this formal situation to just throw it out of proportion. So what time was this particular email that you sent on page 13 of the run blog? Half 27. So that would be before 5 o'clock? Yes. So if we could now turn to the postcard that I referred you to previously, so on page 15. So the women on the postcard, they're in a state of undress, aren't they? Yeah, but it's only a cartoon, it's no big deal. And can you explain what you meant by the view is gorgeous and it's hot in more ways than one? Well, really? If I could refer you now, Mr. Sack, to the disciplinary policy, and we haven't looked at this yet, sir, and you'll find it at Kate from page one of the bundle. Okay, thank you. So again, I'd ask you to look at the whole document. Yes, in its entirety, but I'll read it in chambers, but equally, I'm sure there are parts of the that you're going to take me to, yes, specifically. Sir. Okay, carry on, Ms. Harris. Thank you, sir. Mr. Sack, this policy is stated to be fair and systematic in its approach to the enforcement of acceptable standards of conduct and behaviour amongst all employees. So you've already confirmed that you yourself are an employee of the academy, isn't that right? Yes. And so you're, you are subject to the policy in the same way that Ms Jackson is subject to the policy? Yes. So at paragraph 2.1, which is halfway down on page number one, it states that the procedure is designed to establish facts quickly and deal consistently with disciplinary issues. So Ms Jackson has been dismissed for what you say is a breach of the computer use policy. So we've taken a look at some of your behaviour. Um, in light of the computer use policy and consider that you yourself may have been in breach. So has there been a consistency in approach here, Mr. Well, these are two different cases. And I really don't think that sending around a funny email is the same as using a work computer to access and to send pornographic images. Well, moving on to the next paragraph, Mr. Sack, paragraph 2.2 on page 1. It states here that no disciplinary action will be taken against an employee until the case has been fully investigated. So you've already agreed that literally no investigation took place. So do you consider that you've complied with your disciplinary policy? Uh, I've not agreed that no investigation took place. Mr. Bug carried out the investigation. <coughs> you were just asking me about further investigation that you thought I should have undertaken. In, in fairness, Miss Harris, my note, I've not got a note that he said that no investigation took place. Mm -hmm. my, my note is not exactly those words, but it's similar to what Mr. Dusan has just suggested. You suggested further investigation should be taking place, and he felt not. But in fairness, that's probably a point you can make to me on submissions. It would be safe. Thank you. Mr. De Sack, just drawing to a close, a few final questions for you. Do you accept that if you have fully investigated this matter, yes. you or Mr. Bug may have come across your own emails which may have put a different light on things, and if you had investigated, you may well have come to a different conclusion, that's right, isn't it? Probably not. As I've already said, my joke emails can't be compared with what I would do. But we also know that Miss Jackson here has been treated very differently from an example such as Tracy Weller with regard to having packages delivered. Miss Jackson has been treated inconsistently, hasn't she? Maybe, but I thought the items being delivered were very different. Well, underwear can be ordered from Marks and Spencer's, for example, just as easily as it can be from our service. 
Well, I suppose so, but Max and Spencer's isn't a specialised sex shop. You do know what Miss Weller had delivered to work, don't you? Yeah. So you cannot possibly say whether the items being delivered were very different. No, but it's likely that they were. So we've ascertained, Mr. Lestat, that you say Miss Jackson has sent and received an unreasonable amount and number of personal emails, but you appear to have accessed this in a vacuum, taking no account of the facts whatsoever. So do you agree that you failed to carry out a sufficient investigation or any investigation at all? Well, not really. She admitted everything. You didn't take into account the fact that the Academy's email address was not being used on a public chat room, did you? I don't think that was the point. And did you carry out a fuller investigation of any other employees? No. And um, have you not accessed the adult dating chat room site, the Hunky Hunks? Have you seen the video that Miss Jackson sent to her boyfriend? Have you seen any of the photographs involved? No. Thank you, Mr. De Sack. I don't have any further questions, sir. And unless you have anything else, sir, that they are my they are my questions across the foundation for Mr. De Sack. Thank you. No, I, I've not got anything to ask. Ms. Morgan, do you wish to raise anything on re-examination, Mr. De Sack? No, sir. I, I no re-examination. And that therefore concludes Mr. De Sack's evidence. But it also concludes the case of the respondent. Okay. There, there was an appeal, um, Ms. Morgan. Mr. 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 Stamper. It's referred to in the paper, so that I'm not calling him, sir. That was a, a, an appeal so on the papers at the specific request of Ms. <coughs> Jackson. So the claimant didn't want an appeal hearing? No, she didn't. And she made that, is, is that, is that correct, Ms. Harris? Correct. Yes, sir. Is, is, is there an appeal letter in the... There is, sir. So the, Pages 27 and 28 in the bundle. So that is the uh, the letter of appeal, and so 28 is the outcome from Mr. Stamper. Would you would you give me a second? Yeah, so I will be putting those to Ms. Jackson. Oh, okay, thank you, Ms. Morgan. Would you give me a second? I'll just briefly read through those whilst I'm considering the response. That's very wise, Ms. Harris. Okay, thank you. No, I, I understand then why Mr. Mr. Stamper is not going to call. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. So that is the respondent's case. It is indeed, sir. Thank you very much. Well, if that's concluded, um, then it's, it's for the claimant to, um, to put her case forward, Ms. Harris. Yes, sir. And you said the claimant's calling her own evidence. Just, just the claimant's case, sir. Just the claimant with no further witnesses. And that's the, that's the remaining statement in the bundle right at the back. It is. Um, so before I read this again, if I could ask Ms. Jackson if you could just repeat after me. I understand you wish to take an oath. Um, Catholic oath, we've made very clear. Um, if you could repeat after me, please. Pretend you're holding the Bible. Um, I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give to the tribunal. That the evidence I shall give to the tribunal. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you. Um, so I, I have your statement again. I'm going to adopt the same procedure. I'm going to read it for the next couple of minutes. Um, do you have any additional questions, Ms. Harris, <coughs> Ms. Jackson, before she's cross-examined? No, sir. Nothing has arisen from... Nothing has arisen, uh, but I do, as uh, my friend has ever right to re-examine the following examination. No, of course. Thank you, Ms. Harris. No. <coughs> Excellent. If you'll give me a couple of minutes again to read through. Ms. Morgan, I'd make the same point to you that um, any documents, yes. if you'll give me a second to read through them, but I'm not going to consider a document. Yes, so but some of them may be those that you've already seen. So. No, I appreciate it. Thank you. So that will be Ms. Morgan. Do you, I presume you'll have a couple of questions on cross-examination for on the claimant, Ms. Jackson. Yes, I have a few questions, sir. Good morning, Ms. Jackson. As you know, I represent Shady Academy this morning. I've got a number of questions to you. Let's start at the beginning. Your role throughout the time you were employed at Shady Academy was as a personal assistant to Mr. De Sack, the head teacher, wasn't it? Yes. And in fact, you and Mr. De Sack have been working at the Academy together since it opened, haven't you? Yes, that's right. And over those years, you've developed a close working relationship. We've always gone well, not, not socially, but a good working relationship. What ages are the children at the Academy? Uh, between 11 and 18. Mm. Approximately how many children are there? 800. Do you agree that the school has got an excellent reputation? It, it does, yes, yes. And that's due to the hard work of Mr. Sack and others at the school. Oh, 
Yes, we all work hard and are proud of the school. Mr. Desac put a lot of trust in you to help him carrying out his role in the running of the school, help him maintain standards, didn't he? Well, I don't know what you mean by maintain standards, but yes, he wanted me to do a good job. Well, in essence, uh, Miss Jackson, you were a gatekeeper, weren't you? So if Mr. Desac had an important meeting or phone call, those calls and visitors would come through you in the first instance, wouldn't they? Mm, yes, I suppose so. So you and Mr. Desac would team together, weren't you? If you want to put it like that. And parents and staff and governors and teachers and other people with whom Mr. Desac had dealings on behalf of the school are likely to have contact with you at one time or another. Well, yes, because I am his PA, but I just organise things. I don't make any decisions. But you're part of the public face of the school. Well, yes. And as such, you had some responsibility for the reputation of the school. Oh, well, I guess so. Well, the staff are expected to maintain high standards of behaviour and set an example, isn't that right? Yes, I suppose so. And it's fair to say that students at the academy come in and out of the office to try and see Mr. Sasak quite frequently, don't they? Well, I suppose they do, for good reasons and bad. Yeah. And others coming to the school to see Mr. Sasak, for example, parents, they also pass through your office. Well, yes, you have to go through my office to get to Mr. Sasak's office. So when they're waiting to see Mr. Sasak, where do they wait? Sometimes outside his office, so where my desk was in the outer office, some, sometimes people would try to nip in when he had a free moment, and I always had to try and stop them and check if he was available. So really, anybody who wanted you to see Mr. Desac would come straight to talk to you, whether it be students, parents, others? Yes. So it's not in any way unusual for students or staff to be talking to you by your desk during normal working hours? No, not, not unusual. A lot of the students tend to be quite friendly and would chat to me while they were waiting to see the head teacher, unless they were in trouble, of course. And all of this was occurring on a daily basis? Yes. Would you agree that over the years, Mr. Desac has been flexible, has given staff certain privileges, such as allowing them to use the academy equipment for personal use? Well, yes, I suppose so, provided that it didn't interfere with our work. Um, but what I did didn't interfere with my work. Oh, we'll come to that in due course, Miss Jackson. So prior to October 2013, I think it was, would you have used the Academy's facilities for personal use? Yes, I believe so. What sort of use? The occasional personal email? Yes, I would email my husband to make arrangements for dinner or let him know I'd be late home or if I had to do something. And you also used different internet searches, did you? Um, yes, I suppose so. Would you say that your usage at that time was reasonable? Yes, I guess so. I didn't really use the internet or email that much. I looked at the news at lunchtime and, as I said, I would email my husband about domestic things. But then things changed in the January, didn't they? It was a really bad time. I got divorced and was really depressed. But after a short time, you decided to try internet dating, I think as suggested by your friends. Yes, it, it was a bit of an odd idea at first, but my friend said that everyone was doing it, so yeah, I decided to try. And you chose to follow that use by using your work computer, is that right? Yes. And you thought your work email address would be an appropriate forum to start this new chapter in your life. Well, I didn't have a computer at home, and I didn't see the harm in it. And you were encouraged, were you, to use the Hunky Hunks website by your friend, is that right? Well, that one amongst others, yes. Well, I'll explore that a little more. Have you heard of Match.com? Yes. eHarmony? Yes. Direct Dating? Yes. But out of all the available websites, you chose to sign up to Hunky Hunks, is that right? Well, my friend had met somebody there recently on, on that website, so I thought I'd go for that one. 
Would you agree that the name of the website is indicative of the type of men who register on the site? I don't know what you mean. Well, Mr. Jackson, the definition of hunk according to the Oxford English Dictionary is large, strong, sexually attractive man. Is that what you were looking for when you joined Hunky Hunks? I was just lonely and I wanted to meet someone. Do you accept that there's a clear difference in terms of, certainly, perception between a dating site called Hunky Hunks and another one called the eHarmony? Well, maybe in the name. And one might expect to meet someone for sexual activity on the Hunky Hunks site. It's just a funny name. So, it's correct to say that despite the overtly sexual connotations of this website, you chose to communicate with men who you've never met on a website called Hunky Hunks using equipment provided by an educational institution. Is that right? Mm, yes, but everyone else goes on the internet and the website is and the website isn't how you're making it sound. Right, Mr. Jackson, so I'd like to refer you now to a document in the bundle. Could you please go to page 12? Could you, it's a very short email, sir. Jackson, could, could you just read that for us? Dear all, Amazon has now approved the new computer use policy. Please can all well review the content and sign and return a copy to me. If you have any queries regarding the policy, please let me know. Ian. And is it correct that you received a copy of the email with the Academy's policy on the 25th of April? Well, I was on holiday at the time, so I don't even see it when I came back. But like I said in my witness statement, I don't think I saw it due to the number of emails in my inbox. But that email, you have a look at it again, it was sent to all Stella, wasn't it? Yes. So you were made aware of the fact that a policy was in place, weren't you? Well, if I'd have read the email, then yes. Do you agree it was your responsibility to review all of the emails in your inbox when you came back from holiday? Well, yes, I suppose so. And it was your responsibility to familiarise yourself with it? Well, maybe, but I didn't. Well, <coughs> can we now look at the policy? It's at page uh, 5 to 11, so I think you've already listed this. So, let's look at page 5, shall we, Mr. Jackson. This is the first paragraph, which states the computer equipment provided by the Academy is intended to promote effective communication with the Academy and the world at large on matters relating to the Academy. The facility should therefore be used for that purpose shouldn't be used for purposes detrimental to Academy Ox reputation. That's what it says, isn't it? Yes. Then would you agree that images of naked men and not images the Academy would deem positive in connection with its reputation? Well, it depends on the context. Well, that's one of the world, Ms. Jackson. Can you explain to me in what circumstances pictures of naked men could possibly be considered as part of the ethos of the school? Well, no, but it wasn't about the school. No. Do you think that parents of the students at the academy would be happy to see images of naked men who are trying to impress their prospective girlfriends? Perhaps not. Is it possible that parents of children attending the school would be unhappy that staff members at the school were receiving images of naked men? Is it yes or no, Miss Jackson? Well, yes, of course it's possible, but I didn't ask them to send me those images. They just sent them. So you received more than one image of a naked man, photographs or videos from different senders. Is that right? Yes. Didn't seem unusual to you that men who have never met before were sending pictures of themselves naked? Well, it was just a bit of fun between, between consenting adults. No one else saw them, it was fine. And you thought it was completely appropriate to view those pictures at work. That's correct, isn't it? It wasn't funny anymore. Did you provide an alternative contact for them to send these images? 
No, I don't have a personal email address, so I couldn't ask them to send them to me elsewhere. When you receive the pictures and videos of the naked man, you get me done communicating with the people who'd sent them. Yes. You never asked any of them to stop sending the pictures. No, it was harmless. Why didn't you ask them to stop sending them? I never thought about it. Did you know any of these men when you first started using the website? No. And it's clear from the fact they were naked that there was a sexual element to their interest in you, isn't it? I guess so. Well, we heard earlier from you, Miss Jackson, and you confirmed the fact that the students would sometimes wait to see Mr. Desac and chat to you. Is that correct? Oh, yes. And sometimes people approach your desk when you're not expecting it. I suppose so. So would it be possible that a student may have seen these images when waiting at your desk near your computer? No, no. I always made sure I locked the computer when I was away from my desk and my computer faced the wall. I would have made sure that no one else saw those images as they approached my desk. You see, that's curious, isn't it, Miss Jackson? Because you just stated the images were harmless. So, if that was the case, why would you be so vigilant to make sure that people didn't see them? Because it's private. It's, it's not their business. So, First of all, you would have no problem with, say, an 11 year old girl or boy studying at the academy, seeing the images of the naked men on your computer. No, obviously, I don't want them to see that, which is why I was careful. So the images weren't harmless, were they? Well, they were harmless, but I wouldn't want a child to see them. So you wouldn't want a child to see the images, yet you insisted on downloading the images while you were at work in school, didn't you? Yes, but no children. When the, sorry, could you speak up, Jackson? When? There's no children around. Oh, when there was no children around, yeah. thank you. Okay. But you accept that there was a, always a risk that a child or a parent or someone else could have seen the images while you were viewing them. No, I was careful. Do you think that the parents of any of the children attending the school would find even the possibility of a risk of that happening acceptable? No. Let's go back to the computer use policy again, Ms. Jackson. Let's look at clause 1.5.1 on page 8. To read 1.5.1 for us. We must ensure that any file downloaded from the internet attached to an email, particularly where the sender is unknown to you, or otherwise introduced by you onto the Academy's computer system, is virus checked before it is opened. If you are in any doubt, or if you believe that you may have received or opened a file containing a virus, you must contact the IT manager immediately. Right. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. And when you received the first picture of a naked man, did you virus check the picture or the video? I didn't need to, it just opened. Anyway, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. So the pictures and videos arrived and you just downloaded them and continued with the correspondence as normal, did you? Mm, yes. Which you accept is in breach of the policy. Well, yes, I accept it is now, but I hadn't read it. You accept the policy was in place at the time, but you just hadn't bothered to read it. Yes. Well, let, let's move on. Let's look at 1.3.2 of the policy. That makes it clear, doesn't it, that given that the Academy's name is in the email address, you need to ensure that the tone and content of perks of an email meet standards required for an equivalent letter that was drafted and signed by you and sent on letterhead. Is that correct? Yes. So do you agree you were using the Academy's computer and the Academy's name is referred to in your emails? Yes. And every time you sent an email, does your email have your name, job title and the name of the Academy at the bottom? Yes, it's automatic. 
So when you were sent naked pictures to your email address, the academy link was clearly visible in the email address. Yes. Yes. You think that's a dangerous precedent to set, Miss Jackson, encouraging strange men to send naked pictures and videos of themselves to an address that's clearly a school? It wasn't like that. They weren't sending them to the school. They were sending them to me. <coughs> Do you accept that if any of these emails had been misdirected and had come into the public forum, they would have had the potential to bring the academy into disrepute. But they didn't. Well, is it very fair to say that you would not have written to Daytonian <laughs> Billy who you met at Hunky Hunks using academy letterhead? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Let's have another look at the policy, Ms. Jackson. Let's look at 1.3.4. Now that says, doesn't it, that you're permitted to use your work email address to send and receive personal messages, provided they're reasonable, reasonable in number and length and frequency. Is that right? Yes, that's what it says. Okay, but let's take a closer look at this clause. Let's go on to page seven. And it specifically states, doesn't it, that the email is provided for business use and it shouldn't be used for personal gain, or gossip, or in breach of the Academy's equality and diversity policy. <coughs> That's right, isn't it? I suppose so. So do you accept that your behaviour had the potential to cause serious damage to the reputation of the school? We found out, didn't we, Pat Manson and Mr. Buck? Let me take you to another document, Ms. Jackson. Let's go to page two in the bundle, and that's part of the disciplinary policy. Now, let me take you to 3.5, and that sets out the type of conduct where disciplinary action should be expected and that includes misuse of the academy's facilities and excessive personal use of the telephone or computer. Is that right? Yes, I think so. Well, have a look at it. Is that right, Miss Jackson? Yes, 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 yes. Right. Let's go over the page Three. Let's look at 4.2, which is talking about gross misconduct. And that includes, doesn't it, the use of pornographic sites on the internet and any action likely to bring the academy into disrepute. It's right, isn't it? And that's what it says, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, can you turn on to page 6? Dean of the Bundle. Now again, Ms. Jackson, this is something we've looked at before. And there's a section there about emails, isn't there? Would you like to read out that section? During the last three months, BJ has sent over 107 personal emails and has received 91 non-work related emails. The majority of the emails are from an email account at honkyhunks.com, although the recipient of the email has changed a number of times. Brackets Dave at honkyhunks.com, Tony at honkyhunks.com, and more recently Billy at honkyhunks.com. There was a period of no activity for the half term week and obviously during the Christmas holiday, however, this still equates to over 20 personal emails a day. The majority of the emails are sent either first thing in the morning or after 5 pm. There is the occasional email which is sent in the day. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Well, let's look at the figures a little bit more closely. So taking out the time you had off at half term in Christmas, this is equating to 20 personal emails a day on average. Do you think that that amount is reasonable use of the school's equipment? Other people might have been spending that much time surfing the internet. 
uh, email in as well. But other people weren't receiving pictures and videos of naked men. Who are they, Miss Jackson? Oh, no. Okay. Let's look further at that. And we look at the paragraph that talks about internet. Let's have a look at that. You had a look, Miss Jackson? I have, yes. Yeah. And Mr. Bug is confirming to Mr. DeSac that you've been viewing sites which contain pornographic content and <coughs> online chat rooms. Is that correct? No, I didn't look at any pornographic sites. I, I did sign up to sites with online chat rooms. Right. Let me take you on to another document then, Miss Jackson. Let's go to page 22 of the bundle. And this is the record of your disciplinary hearing. And you acknowledge that while at work you have been accessing adult websites where you chat with other consenting adults and discuss having fun with men. Is that correct, Miss Jackson? Um, let, let me just look. Never access porn at work. Is it the bottom paragraph you're referring to this morning? It is, sir. Yes. Okay. So the bottom box, PJ, carries on to the top of 23. Okay, thank you. Well, Ms. Jackson, do you accept that discussing fun with men and using the signing sexy mama BJ indicates discussions of a sexual nature? It's just consenting adults having a laugh. Do you accept that in using your academy email address to register the website, you were linking the academy with the adult chat room? No one would have known the people in the chat room. I think that they keep your email private until I accept the contact. Uh, do you accept that this would be perceived by parents and students negatively if it became public knowledge? Well, there may have been grown ups about it. What consenting adults do in their own time is their own business. But how would you explain the fact when Mr. Bug accessed the sites? that you were looking at, he states that it's so pornographic content. I don't know. You accepted in the disciplinary hearing that you had accessed online chat forums using the Academy's email address and computer, didn't you? Mm -hmm. Yes, I did. But do you accept, Miss Jackson, that the definition of pornography in the Oxford English Dictionary is printed in visual material intended to stimulate sexual excitement? I don't know the precise definition, but I guess so. Is it not the case that you were discussing matters which were intended to cause sexual excitement in the other party? Oh, it was just a bit fun between consenting adults. Well, do you agree with this, that there are a wide range of behaviours that consenting adults indulging in the privacy of their own homes, but a school is not the appropriate forum in which to explore those interests. Well, no, but it's not like he's getting into anything in the school. Well, you recorded a video of yourself in your underwear and sent it to your boyfriend using the academy email address, didn't you? Yes, but it was marked private. It was his birthday. But according to your assertion at the disciplinary hearing, and in the in your witness statement, you consider this was no different at all to someone showing pictures of themselves on the beach in a bikini. Yes. But if there's nothing dirty or sexual about it, why would you be embarrassed? I felt it was private. So, uh, would you give a picture of yourself in your underwear to your mother or father? No. And if you went shopping and bought some new knickers, would you take a photograph and bring a picture of yourself into work and show your colleagues in your underwear? No. And the reason that the images of you in your underwear would be interesting to your boyfriend is because images of you in a state of undress <coughs> are fundamentally of a sexual nature. I just wanted to show him what was fun. So why then did you send a video to your boyfriend as a gift for his birthday? Wasn't because he's got an interest in styles of women's underwear, is it, Miss Jackson? No. It's because you you wanted him to desire you sexually. Yes. 
So it's not true that the images were not of a sexual nature. Oh, not entirely, but it wasn't porn or anything. Right, let's go back again to the documents, Miss Jackson. And let's look at page 10. We're back with the uh, computer and internet policy again. And let's look at 1.7. <coughs> And then we've got 1.71 and 1.72. Now, the policy there sets out a list of examples of serious misuse, doesn't it? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. And let's look at 1.723. And the policy says that deliberately accessing, viewing, downloading, receiving, transmitting, or posting to an internet use group any material of an indecent, obscene, pornographic, or otherwise similarly inappropriate nature. That's correct, isn't it? Yes, but again, I haven't read it. Do you think Ofsted would view your actions as acceptable if they knew about them? I suppose not. Let's go to page 20 of the London Ball. Now, <coughs> this is about the disciplinary hearing, isn't it? Yes. yes. Would, you, would you give me a second? Indeed. Let me just, this is the invitation to disciplinary hearing. Yes, sir. If you'll give me a second, yes. maybe just 20 to 21, just give me one minute and I'll read through that. You referenced earlier non virus checking um, attachments. That's not a specific disciplinary allegation that was put to the plaintiff, is that right? No, I accept that, though. It was merely for. Okay. Yeah, please. Thank you. No, absolutely fine. Yeah. Sorry, please carry on. Now, that letter refers, doesn't it, to you, in essence, receiving packages of while at work, in fact, we're talking us about something from Anne Summers, aren't we? Yes, that's correct. I'd like to take you on to page 23. This is the disciplinary, the next of the disciplinary interview. And towards the bottom of that page, you said in the disciplinary hearing that essentially getting something from Anne Summers was no different than Tracy Weller getting tasteful underwear from M&S, didn't you? Yes, that's, that's correct. And do you agree that Anne Summers is a shop that has a reputation for selling items which are designed to be of a sexual nature? Like underwear? But it's not just underwear, is it, Miss Jackson? It, it, it's not like Marks and Spencers, is it? I mean, Anne Summers don't sell comfortable pairs of size 16 knickers, do they? Mm, no, but it does sell underwear. Well, Miss Jackson does, but the nature of goods it sells are well known for their sexually explicit nature, aren't they? Some people might not realise that it, it's now started doing some quite tasteful underwear as well. Well, as well as what, Miss Jackson? Pieces. So, do you agree that Anne Summers is a purveyor of adult goods, including sex toys? Oh, yeah, I suppose so, but that's not what I have delivered. Well, again, we're on page 23 of the bundle, again, with minutes of a disciplinary meeting. You appear to admit that you've had more than one parcel delivered to you from Anne Summers. Is that right? Well, yes, but as I say, I was always there. I always received them, so it couldn't upset anyone. Well, let's say, for example, the student, or even worse, a parent, saw that unsummer's packages were being delivered to the school. Uh, do you think they'd have taken a progressive approach? Perhaps not. Do you accept this may not be acceptable to a mother trying to keep their children away from the influences what is becoming an overtly sexualized society? Well, maybe not. I don't know. No. Do you agree the reason you were dismissed is because your actions had the potential to bring the academy into disrepute? I don't think it's fair, but I 
do understand the reasons. Yes. Well, let's go back to the bundle again, Ms. Jackson. Let's look at page 19. Uh, now, page 19 is the notes of the first meeting with you. And when you spoke to Mr. De Sack at this point, I think it was 29th of January, you accepted you'd been emailing men from Hunky Hunks to arrange dates and chat online with them, didn't you? Yes. And you also accepted that you'd been viewing many images of the men you'd been communicating with on the Academy's equipment, didn't you? Yes. And you admitted accessing adult websites. Yes. And you admitted making a video as a birthday present for your boyfriend. And you were informed of Mr. De Sack's concerns over the high value of volume of personal emails you'd been receiving from Hunky Hunks, weren't you? Mm, yes, at the beginning of the meeting, I think. Yeah. And at that meeting, you were told explicitly that you breached the computer use policy. Yes. And you were told it could lead to your dismissal. Yes. So you fully understood that matters were very serious. So it's fair to say, isn't it, Ms. Jackson, that when you left that meeting, it was very clear to you why you had been suspended? I suppose so. I didn't agree with it, though. No, but you knew why it was happening. I think so. Right. Now, the 29th of January, when you had that meeting, I think it was a Tuesday, wasn't it? Um, yes, yes. And then you were invited to a disciplinary meeting on the 1st of February. Yes. So you had time to consider the allegations and raise any concerns. Yes, I'd agree with that. Yeah. And let's go on, let's go over the page to page 20. We've looked at this already, Ms. Jackson, but that's the letter <coughs> inviting you to the disciplinary meeting, isn't it? Yes, that's correct. And you agree, don't you, that the allegations against you are set out in that letter? Yes, I suppose so. Yeah. And the letter tells you that matters are considered to be very serious and they could result in termination of your employment. Yes. Yes. So you understood that if the allegations against you were found proved, you might be dismissed. Yes. And we can see from the letter, if we look at page 21, that's the second page, that you were offered the opportunity to write any information you wanted to in your defence prior to the hearing taking place. Yes. Did you provide any evidence? Well, no. And you were offered the opportunity to bring along a trade union representative or a fellow employee, weren't you? Yes. And you chose not to. No. And then you go to the disciplinary meeting on the 1st of February, and if we go over again, go to page 22 and onwards to 24. Those are the notes of that meeting, aren't they? Yes. And do you agree, Mr. Desaic, explain the seriousness of the allegations against you right at the beginning of the hearing? Yes. And he made it clear to you that if the allegations were found to be true, you'd be dismissed. Yes. Yes, I suppose so. And then each of the allegations was put to you, and you were given the opportunity to provide an explanation. Yes. 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 And you were given the opportunity at the hearing to raise any concerns you have about the investigation. Well, I was asked to explain my position. Ms. Jackson, you failed to raise any points at the disciplinary hearing about investigation, didn't you? Well, I talked about how other people did the same thing as me. But you see, you agreed that at the meeting, the earlier meeting on the 29th of January, you already admitted the allegations. Well, yes. And you admitted those allegations again at the disciplinary hearing. Yes, but the night in the background as well. So it's fair to say, isn't it, Miss Jackson, that given that you admitted to your actions, there was very little else to investigate, was there? Well, 
I suppose not, but other people had had deliveries to the school as well. Yeah, do you accept there was no evidence at all that other academy staff members were downloading pictures of naked men? I suppose so. But given that you'd admitted that the allegations against you were correct, there was just no need to undertake any further investigation, was there? Well, they may be more prudish than me. What? There's no evidence other staff members were uploading images of themselves in a state of undress, sending those images outside the academy, is there? Yeah, but Anson sent that email out with all the sex and the girls and the rude and those cards. Did you raise that point with him at the disciplinary hearing? No. Did you raise it in your appeal letter? Oh, no. Do you accept that there's a fundamental difference between you and to carry on humour in a traditional seaside postcard and images of naked men being sent from strangers to a school? Well, the postcard had women on it. Do you accept Mr. de Sack's email was sent internally? Oh, yes. But the emails you were sending went outside the academy with the academy's name on them, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Yes, so. Did you complain about Mr. de Sack's email at the time? No. Did you complain about the postcard at the time? No, I didn't. So, cartoon postcards are offensive to you, but parcel sometimes some has been delivered to school completely acceptable. <laughs> Let's move on. Mr. Sack listened to your explanations before he made a decision, didn't he? No, yes. yes. Do you agree that you made Mr. Dusak specifically aware of your length of service, disciplinary record, any mitigation had before the meeting was adjourned? And the meeting was adjourned for almost an hour and a half, wasn't it, Miss Jackson? Um, yes, I remember I had to wait a while. Uh, and following that meeting, you received an outcome letter. Let's go on to page 25 to 26, which yes. confirmed matters, didn't it? It did, yes. But I don't think you see this. I have it. You, again, would you give me a moment just to read through? Because there uh, may be a couple of questions I have in relation to Sorry, carry on. Thank you very much. Ms. Jackson, it's clear, isn't it, that Mr. de Sack, in that letter, is very concerned about the association of the Academy with the types of websites and organisations which you become involved in. That's right, isn't it? Yes. And you accept it was reasonable for him to have those concerns? That explained that it wasn't what he thought it was. Was it reasonable for him to have those concerns, yes or no, Ms. Jackson? Yes, so. And is it correct that you were offered a right of appeal? Yes. Let's go to page 27, and then we've looked at these, and that's your letter of appeal, isn't it? Yes. And you specifically ask that a paper appeal is carried out. Yes. You had the opportunity to raise all of the points you wanted to, and they've done in this tribunal, but you didn't mention any of those at the time of your appeal, did you? No, no. Well, let's go to page 28 of the appeal. That's the letter from Mr. Stamper, the Chair of Governors. That's right, isn't it? Yes. And if we look at that letter, it's clear from that letter that Mr. Stamper says he's considered all the documents and he's spoken to Mr. Bug and to Mr. de Sapp. That's right, isn't it? Yes. You didn't put any further evidence to him, did you? No. Despite being given the opportunity to do so? I was just too upset. <coughs> do you accept that Mr. Stomper in his position as the Chair of Governors is in a position to consider what parents from the school community would consider to be acceptable? Probably. Do you agree that the Academy was within its rights, no matter how harsh it might seem to you, to expect high standards of personal behaviour from its staff? And so they set an example for students. To an extent, but we all have a right to a private life. Would you accept that your actions, if they were made public, would be likely to bring the academy into disrepute? Mm -hmm. Yes, I suppose, but they weren't public, it was private. Ms. Jackson, I'm open for the question. Thank you, Ms. Mulder. Um, Ms. Harris, do you have any re examination for, uh, I have one question for the claim? 
course. Um, Ms. Jackson, um, my friend mentioned to you earlier um, and asked a question whether whether or not you uh, admitted the allegations in the in the letter that we looked at at page twenty of the bundle. Can you just confirm for the tribunal's benefit whether you um, are of opinion that the specific allegations that you stated you admitted to fall underneath the misuse of the academy's computer systems? I believe the the reference is paragraph one seven two three of the bundle. Do you, do you believe that they fell under the policy, those allegations? I think you're leading well, the well, 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 yeah, well, slightly, Ms. Harris, no, but I, no, in no. fairness, I, I have got a note from Ms. Jackson no. that, she's, that she doesn't accept. That, Thank you, that, sir. That, so, that, so, 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 in retrospect, I think it's a matter of fact for you to determine. It's, yeah, no. yeah I, I, th I think you're quite right. I, I take your point. She accepted certain actions, she didn't interpret the, um, uh, the manner in which the respondent interpreted the matter in her position. Thank you, sir. No, I've got that. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for your Mr. Jackson. Um, right. Really, all that leaves is uh, it's time for submissions. Um, and as the respondent started, he gets the last word. So, Ms. Um, Harris, have you got any submissions, any matters you'd like me to take into account um, in determining this matter? I do, sir. As we've already you mentioned at the, at the outset, sir, I won't go through the different matters that you have to determine today. I believe those have been already covered. Um, so, save us to say, sir, I will cover the, the facts in a, in a brief format to, for both myself and my friends, just to, um, as a summary for you, prior to any further submissions. Um, so I would also, as you said, there were some there were some law that you've actually looked at, but I would like to bring some cases to your attention just as persuasive cases, sir. So firstly, I'd like to bring a case that regards any policies that are enforced, any sanctions, sir, that apply to that to employ employees when they breach those policies. They should be um, applied consistently and fairly, and that's the case I'd like to refer you to of Robinson and Network IT Recruitment. And this established that if the employer indicates in its policy that offensive jokes or images should be circulated and um, should not be circulated in the workforce, um, but then permits some employees to send jokes or images of that nature, singling out, for example, one employee for dismissal, as has happened in the case of Ms. Jackson, um, it would likely to be unfair in that scenario. Um, another case that I'd like to bring to your attention, sir, is um, the case where employers should not have a knee-jerk reaction to cases involving pornography. For example, by failing to afford the employee the opportunity to explain their behaviour or challenge the disciplinary findings. This is the case of Royal Bank of Scotland and Gaudi, um, where the EAT upheld the tribunal's finding of unfair dismissal on the basis that an employee who was dismissed in that case for sending pornographic images had not actually been shown the company's internal matrix categorising the certain levels of offensiveness of those particular um, images, um, which did have a bearing on the circumstances of the case. So if you would have that in mind, sir, when determining your judgment. And finally, one case with regards to investigations, which I know you've raised as a point, sir, um, where the employee admits the misconduct, the employee will not have to usually conduct an investigation. That's the case of Royal Society for the Protection of Birds and Crouch, which I believe my friend may refer to or use as weight. However, sir, I, I would say that that's not always the case. I'd like to refer you to the case of Campbell, where, um, where the employee acted reasonably under all the circumstances, um, and sometimes it may entail conducting an investigation in the circumstances where new information has come to light, and I think that's relevant for us here, sir. Um, and I will refer to certain points of the ACAS Code of Practice, which uh, applies to the uh, to the employer in this case. I won't read all of the particular bits of the code that they have to refer to, but there are three particular elements that I'd like to bring to your attention. Firstly, that the code says that employers and employees should act consistently um, and that they should carry out necessary investigations to establish the facts, which I think is a key point here for Ms. Jackson. And finally, that employers should inform employees of the basis of their problem and give them an opportunity to put their case and response before any decisions are made. Sir. So those are the specific cases, and, and I'll now turn to the facts of the matter for, for your uh, review. So the respondent employed the claimant as a personal assistant to the head teacher in May 2000, and prior to January 2013, the claimant had a clear disciplinary record. During that month, sir, the respondent's IT manager, Mr. IT Bug, carried out an investigation into the personal internet use of the claimant and determined that she'd been sending an excessive amount of personal emails and had been accessing an adult chat room on pubhooks.com. Mr. Bug found that certain images had been sent to the claimant which showed men in a state of undress. He also came across a private email from the claimant to her then boyfriend which contained a video of her in a state of undress. 
Later on in January, sir, the respondent said, teacher, Mr. De Sack, who we've heard evidence from today, called the claimant to an immediate meeting without notice and without any details of what would be discussed. At this meeting, Mr. De Sack provided the claimant with no supporting evidence with regards to those allegations. And at that meeting, sir, it is important to note that the claimant denied she'd done anything wrong and did not think her actions had harmed anybody. Mr. Uh, Mr. De Sack suspended the claimant later on in that month, on the 29th of January, sorry, on the same day as the investigatory meeting, and invited the claimant to a disciplinary hearing to take place on the 1st of February. By Mr. De Sack's own admission today, sir, little or no investigation of the allegations took place. He had not viewed any of the emails, sir, or documents in, in, in question himself personally. The claimant wasn't interviewed and as part of any investigation process whatsoever and the respondent also failed to carry out any further investigation into the personal abuse following Mr I.T. Burke's findings. Other allegations were made about the claimant, for example, the parcel from Anne Summers, um, and there was no investigation into whether or not the employees did the same thing. Um, the claimant attended the disciplinary meeting, which we've seen the notes of today, and Mr De Sack chaired this meeting, determined then there that Ms Jackson um, should be dismissed with immediate effect. So turning to the case law that the um, law that we have to look at in terms of unfair dismissal, sir, and firstly with regards to whether or not this act amounted to anything such as gross misconduct. On the claimant's testimony today, sir, she denies that that personal incident use included emails and um, including emails sent between her and Matthew Hunky Hunts were pornographic, obscene or indecent for the terminology of the policy that we've looked at. Given that the respondent's dismissing officer and purported investigatory officer, that being Mr. De Sack in both instances, he did not review or consider any of the content of the website or the emails, and therefore, so it be my submission that he's unable to confirm whether or not it fell under the policy in either way. Therefore, it would be my submission, sir, and on the claimant's conduct and on the evidence, that what she did fell very short of gross misconduct. Now, to, so turning to the case of the virtual criteria, which you referred to earlier, and whether or not uh, Mr. De Sack and the respondent had a genuine belief and a reasonable grounds upon which to base that genuine belief that it was an act of gross misconduct. Whilst Mr. De Sack may genuinely have believed that the claimant had accessed pornographic websites and engaged in a provocative exchange of pictures and emails based on what Mr. I.T. Berg had told him, it doesn't therefore follow that in this case Mr. De Sack himself had reasonable grounds upon which to sustain a belief of such that Mr. I.T. Berg had forwarded to him. On his own evidence, he didn't carry out an investigation and he failed to consider the claimant's position that these were harmless exchanges between two individuals, sir. He never looked at the emails, the website, the pictures, or indeed the video, so he was wholly incapable of determining whether this amounted to gross misconduct and therefore simply only took the view of Mr. I.T. Berg over his PA, who indeed had worked for him for a considerable period of time with a clean disciplinary record. Turning to the point of whether or not there was a reasonable investigation is the third element of the of the virtual test, sir. I repeat my comments with regards to the investigation that I've already mentioned in terms of the lack of investigation that took place. He didn't review any of the evidence himself. He never considered looking into any other employees' personal use of their work computers. And indeed, sir, he failed to take account of the conduct of other employees, particularly when it came to the policy, the computer use policy, and the tribunal had seen that Mr. De Sack's conduct could itself have been considered gross misconduct. So neither Mr. De Sack took into account um, or investigated the personal deliveries made to the office to the claimant herself or that of any other employees such as Tracy Weller. In the circumstances, therefore, sir, I would submit that, it's a failure, that there was a failure to conduct any investigation and therefore that was unreasonable. The respondent himself stated that he did not need to conduct an investigation because the claimant had held up her hand to the allegation. So I would say that that's not strictly true, and as I mentioned before with regards to the two cases, the claimant never admitted to accessing pornographic material and simply did not accept the slant that the, that the respondent actually put on her actions. And in, that, in, in, and in any event, sir, I did refer you to the case of Campbell, which sets out the test whether the employee acted reasonably in all the circumstances. And if an employee does hold up their hands to a specific allegation, it may um, entail conducting an investigation if new matters come to light, which I believe was the case following the disciplinary hearing, sir. It's my submission that even if the tribunal found that the claimant did accept the allegations, the circumstances were such that an investigation would have been reasonable when you take into consider to consideration the claimant's account, Mr. De Sack's behaviour as admitted through his witness evidence today, and the fact that other employees, such as Tracy Weller, um, had personal items delivered to the office. Turning to the ACAS code, where we refer to some sections that I'd like you to consider, sir, the failure and disregard to investigate um, and 
the element of consistency, which I believe was non-existent in this particular case, is clearly outside of the ACAS code of best practice for employers. In terms of the procedure that was followed, so I'd like to raise a few points with regards to that. The claimant, as, as you may have seen, was given no notice of that first investigatory meeting that she was called to. She was provided with no details of what will be discussed, and throughout the whole process, she was never provided in, in any hard copy form, sir, the evidence that was used against her. This, is, is there a requirement under the ACAS Code? So, no, no, I accept your point, sir. In terms of investigations, uh, there is no requirement for her to be provided with advance notice. Um, however, so I think it would be indicative to show of the nature of how the respondent dealt with the, the claimant in, in the entire process. Moving on, sir, with regards to the evidence, she wasn't provided any of it, even through the whole process following uh, the disciplinary hearing. She was not provided with details of what it was that she'd done that was so offensive, sir, and, and I referred you to the case of Gaudi earlier. Um, I believe that that should be followed in this regard. Mr. De Sack also never explained in express terms at any point, sir, that the allegations could be found to be gross misconduct, only that they could result in her dismissal. <laughs> So, sir, I would submit that if the virtual criteria were satisfied, which is obviously denied by the claimant, the tribunal should still be satisfied, as you mentioned at the outset, sir, that dismissal of the claimant should fall within a band of reasonable responses open to the respondent. Can I interrupt you again? Yes, you can, sir. Does it matter that they prefer to dismissal rather than specifically to gross misconduct? Does it make a difference? I would say, sir, again, as was my point about investigations, that it should be indicative of the fact that um, the claimant should, should really have been told about it and it just shows the conduct that the respondent had towards the claimant throughout the whole process. Mm -hmm. My submission, further to the points that I've already made to you, um, that it was not the case that an investigation um, was followed and that it fell within the band of reasonable responses. So they, they failed to follow their own disciplinary policy, as I've uh, alluded to today. They failed to comply with the ACAS code or take into account any other relevant information, such as the behaviour and conduct of other employees, even the respondent Mr. Dislack himself. So finally, I'd like to discuss the point of consistency that's raised in the ACAS code as well. There's been no consistency in this case, I'd submit, and, and, and that the decision to dismiss the claimant was therefore unreasonable in all the circumstances. I referred to you to the case of Robinson at the outset, and I believe that may help you um, in determining your decision about whether it's an unfair dismissal or not. Given that the head teacher, Mr. De Sack, engaged in a blatant, I would submit, and fundamental breach of the computer use policy himself, but have not been subjected to any disciplinary action, it seems unfair, therefore, that the claimant herself should be dismissed in that context. Further, the fact that other employees had personal items delivered to work, as you've heard, without issue raised by Mr. De Sack, but that this was a contrib I believe this would be a contributing factor, sir, to how the claimant was treated. So, to conclude, sir, the ultimate question for you to determine is whether in this particular case the dismissal was a reasonable response to the misconduct alleged. The claimant had an exemplary record for over 10 years, which I, was, which I would ask that you take into consideration when you determine your judgment, sir. She had continued to produce excellent work and had not seen the policy of herself, which she was alleged to have breached. And was going through a particularly difficult emotional time, as you've heard, with regards to her divorce. The respondent failed in almost every respect to conduct a proper and reasonable investigation. If it had, the conclusion reached, I submit, could have been very different. I accept that it's not for you to determine, sir, what, it, what you would have done in the circumstances, but instead to determine whether dismissal was outside of the range of reasonable responses that a reasonable employer should take. So, so I would submit that neither the virtual test nor the frozen foods test that you referred to earlier have been complied with. So for the reasons set out above, I submit the claim's dismissal was unreasonable and the procedure adopted and consequently the dismissal were unfair. So I'd ask that you find in favour of the claimant and determine this matter as an unfair dismissal and therefore following that that there was a breach of contract in respect of her notice pay. So unless you have any other questions for me, sir? I have one question, Ms. Harris. Yes. Um, and it relates to your inconsistency argument. Yes. Um, I presume you're raising a general inconsistency argument in accordance with Para 4 of the ACAS code that you yes, referenced, sir. rather than a specific inconsistency that I might be looking at on an East Surrey and Paul type of case. This isn't an identical action for no, which there's sir. an inconsistent treatment. You're talking about general inconsistency. Some employees breach the IT policy. You're going to say about Mr. De Sack. Yes, sir. And nothing happens. Suddenly we breach the policy, potentially like your client, and the ultimate sanction takes place. Yes, sir. And there should okay. be an account taken by the employer. Yes. Okay. No, I, I have that. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very useful. Ms. Morgan. Thank you, sir.
suggest that this was a wholly fair dismissal. Uh, the I'd expected that you probably would, Miss Morgan, but carry on. So obviously what happened in this case is that the IT department found that there was increased usage of the computer systems, and that has never been challenged. That was investigated, and quite properly investigated by Mr. Bug, who knew what he was <coughs> looking for, he was the IT expert, and he came forward with the fact that Miss Jackson's usage was out of all proportion to anyone else's <coughs> and he was able to find other very specific information about the nature of that usage and quite properly that information was passed on to Mr. Dussac. And again, my submission quite correctly, Mr. Dussac decided that he would need to speak to Miss Jackson about that and that led to the meeting of the 29th of January. Now in my submission there was no requirement whatsoever to give Miss Jackson any prior notification of that meeting or any information about what was going to be discussed that is not required by the APAS code and indeed giving that type of information can in many cases, as you will be aware, be entirely counterproductive to the process. It is not the norm. Uh, and Miss Jackson comes into that meeting and in terms she accepts all of the matters that are put to her. My friend says she didn't think she was doing anything wrong. In my submission, so that's not the relevant question. It's not whether she thought she was doing anything wrong. It's whether she's admitting to the allegations at that point, and she very, very clearly is. She's then invited quite <coughs> properly to a disciplinary meeting. There is a reasonable gap between the first meeting and the letter of the 29th of January and the disciplinary meeting <coughs> of the 1st of February. She's told what the allegations are, she's told that they're serious. In my view is there was no need, strictly speaking, to tell her that these were gross misconduct allegations because it was made clear to her that they could result in dismissal. It, in some senses, an employer in those circumstances is damned if they do and damned if they don't. If they mention gross misconduct, the employee says there's been pre-decision, and if they don't mention it, they're criticised again. But she's told that it, it, it's very serious. She's told all that she can have um, a representative now, with her, and in terms in, in, in the disciplinary meeting, she again accepts the allegations. She doesn't at any point uh, challenge them. She may challenge whether she thinks they're serious or not, but she doesn't challenge the events that, that are, are happening. And so in those circumstances, what the respondent says to you is that there is clear underlying misconduct here on any view of matters. That when we look at whether it was reasonable to treat this as sufficient for dismissal and to look at, at the, the Birchill tasks, did Mr. Sapp genuinely believe the employer was guilty of misconduct? I'd suggest he, he, he certainly did. Did he have reasonable grounds for that? He had the information uh, from uh, his IT department, and he had the clear admissions from uh, Miss Jackson. So was he forming that belief on reasonable grounds? Uh, I think, sir, that yes, he was. Uh, and, and that in accordance with, with the Royal Society, protection of birds and croucher case, that if there is a clear admission of misconduct, then the respondent doesn't have to go and conduct further investigations. 
And whilst one accepts that the burden lies on the respondent, it is clear that at no point, either in the initial process or during the appeal, did Miss Jackson ask for any of this evidence to be produced. And you may think that she didn't do that because she was likely to be deeply embarrassed by the content that was forthcoming if she did so. So my friend makes much of uh, consistency here. <coughs> Whatever you think about the items that have been put forward that Mr. Dusak circulated, you're perfectly entitled to think that they're not palatable. On the other hand, beware so that seaside postcards are now considered a form of art and apparently change hands for thousands of pounds. But so, even if you think they're not in the best possible taste, there is a huge gap between those items and the type of sexual photographs that were coming in from men who used the hunky hunk site. There, there is no uh, element of, of consistency to be looked at here in, in, in my uh, submission. So at the end of the day, it's a combination of the circumstances that lead to Miss Jackson's dismissal. So the respondent says that these were extremely serious matters, that there was sufficient evidence, and that it was a proper determination that there should be a dismissal. It was a proper right of appeal. Ms. Jackson chose to ask that to be dealt with in a, a certain way. It was dealt with in that certain way. I suggest this isn't a knee-jerk reaction. There was an investigation meeting, there was a disciplinary meeting, and there was an appeal. So I remind you, as I must, but which I know you are well aware of, that it is not the Romans tribunal to substitute its decision for that of the school and Mr. Dussac. It's not what you as an individual think about these matters, it's whether it's reasonable in connection with section 98 and in connection with the virtual test. And I say to you that the respondent has passed all of those hurdles and that the dismissal was fair. Thank you, Ms. Morgan. Thank you very much. Right, I'm going to take some time to consider my decision, as you would expect. You've all been sat there for about two hours, and we'll probably need both a coffee and the toilet. Um, we're going to adjourn for about 20 minutes until midday. Um, when we come back, before I give a decision, it's your opportunity to ask questions of either the witnesses, before I give a decision, so it might influence what, what I think. Um, equally, you can ask the advocates. Um, you, as I say, they, they are there for your disposal, so if you want to say, why didn't you ask about this? Why didn't you say that? This is your opportunity to do so. And have a go. They'll, they'll have some good answers for you, I bet. And they'll really thank me for saying that. Um, <laughs> and, um, and also, before I give a decision, we'll have a short vote. See who you think has won, whether you think the claimant has won a case, or whether you think the respondent has successfully defended the case. Okay, so we'll have about 20 minutes and then I don't want to show up hands. Don't worry about what the person next to you thinks, because, hey, they've got as much chance as you have. Um, <laughs> who thinks that the claimant has won? <coughs> Put your hand down. <laughs> At five, six, okay. And who thinks the respondent successfully defended the claim? Oh, good, okay. For reasonably even a bit fractionally in favour of the claimant. Good. Okay, um, has anyone got any questions? I've yeah. actually got one. Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, Go ahead. Sorry, I'm an HR consultant. Oh, um, <laughs> 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 it, was only, it was only really, if, I, if I'd been advising personally, and I've stuck my hand up in favour of the claimant, but. Yeah. And there's a few areas I'd be a bit perturbed about. But one of the things which was very briefly touched upon, which I would have advised the client to speak out very carefully, was there was a mention of <coughs> divorce, breakdown, depression. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It took time. There was no <laughs> nothing appeared to come out in yes. terms of trying to understand and investigate 
Was there a medical condition under possible medical supervision? What effect might that have had on behaviour, etc., 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 etc.? So, to my mind, that didn't seem to come out hardly at all, really. I would have been interested in finding a little bit more about it if I'd been the, the person doing the uh, I think, I think she raised it more <coughs> in her statement and at the hearing yeah. than she did. Yeah. At, at the time, yeah. and it's one of the issues that the claimant has in this case, mm. is that she raises lots of things. For instance, you know, the funny, the funny email and postcard and things. Mm. She raises at the time of hearing, she doesn't raise at the time of dismissal. And it would have really, really, really helped her yeah, yeah. if she'd raised them at the disciplinary hearing. Yeah. Because it would have given a better argument of consistency. And likewise, she didn't really raise all the yeah, divorce, feeling really low, etc. Yeah, yeah. She doesn't say it before dismissal. She says it in her statement. Mm. She, you're quite, she does allude to certain things. Mm. Um, but I, I, I might be wrong. No. Play the threat. <laughs> no, I agree with that. And I think the added factor, the fact that she, she didn't bring it up during employment, I think, is a, is a key issue because. Mm. Um, if you are looking down the illness or the health route, and mm. you're therefore then looking to any potential disability route, which obviously mm. hasn't been claimed to be discrimination, yeah. Yeah. but it wasn't aware, the employer <coughs> wasn't aware that there was anything suggested in that regard, and she hadn't mentioned it either. But had it have been mentioned earlier, mm. then yes, I suppose it would have been advised for a prudent employer to engage Ex in that process. Except, and have state, it sorry, yeah. sorry to interrupt, but there's a statement somewhere that this gentleman over here providing support and some financial support to the claimant at a difficult time, which I think it's fair to say was the time when the claimant was going through the divorce and post. Yeah. I think, from what I think yeah. earlier. But there might have been more made of it. Yeah. And again, <clears throat> the claimant didn't make a big deal of it in the claim. Yeah. She wouldn't have got very far with me in fairness if she had them. Mm. Um, it's a process point now, I think, as well. It is. Um, yeah. And therefore the respondent doesn't really pick up and deal with it. Mm. Also, we, we, we're condensing. We're massively, massively <laughs> condensing. Um, because I, I always feel on these that I'm, I'm making you look at the document every two and a half minutes, and I appreciate that's not the most exciting thing. Whereas in reality, in a truck, you're usually your bundle, even for a relatively straightforward matter, is probably about four mm. times the size. Mm. Because yes, as you say, someone will have more to say, you might be looking at a medical history, you're dealing with a real person rather yeah, than yeah. Siobhan. Um, you know, so, um, <laughs> so, um, yeah. I, think, I think process is an important as well because the fact is that obviously you mentioned that he was aware of it. Um, I did very, I, I, if we'd have had longer, I would have brought out some more information about the fact yeah. that he shouldn't have done the investigation and the disciplinary, yeah, should have yeah. been separate people yeah, yeah. Um, if you're trying to do best practice. But also mm. with regards to his knowledge, I potentially would have also advised that someone else deal with the investigation, not him if he's involved with the emotional aspect. And he would likely to have been interviewed. There was no interview process in the investigation, so she should have been interviewed. If there was more made of the stress and divorce, he should have been interviewed. So it's that it, my point about process was yeah, the fact yeah. that there was not yeah, a great yeah, process. So yeah. it could have come yeah, out in yeah. but I But I think it's a perennial problem that as practitioners that we come across, and it doesn't matter whether we're acting for a claimant or or, or, mm. or the employer, mm. that, 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 that after the event we're provided with sort of shed loads of information mm. that, that the client says to us, this is relevant, and we have to say, well, okay, it's relevant in some ways, but actually, as it wasn't in the forum at the time that the dismissal was dealt with, sorry guys, it's yeah, not I'm, relevant. I'd certainly agree with that. In fact, we were talking with Colin just earlier about Hindsight's a wonderful thing. At the time, you're in the middle of it, other things are going on, and it's very easy after the event to dissect and say you should have this, you should have that. We were talking about that yeah. way over the brain. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, also, um, it's also sort of an interesting point, and again, both representatives mentioned it, but it's, um, it's slightly off point, but, but ultimately, what the tribunal isn't doing is it isn't looking to make its own factual mm -hmm. findings, it is looking to see what was the respondent aware of at the time. So actually after the event, all sorts of things come out. Actually after the event, evidence may come out that entirely exonerates the claimant. Mm -hmm. Entirely irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Or only, only relevant to the issue of, well, should, uh, should any reasonable investigation have found that? And if the answer is no, it's just wholly irrelevant to the decision. But yes. just, just in this case, obviously the, the claimant and the respondent were referring to the policy at all times. But it was clear that the policy had not been adopted by uh, Miss Jackson. That, that you know she had not 
she'd, she'd had an email but not signed to say that she'd read it and adopted it as a policy that we're going to be enforced. So yeah. at that point, you as a judge, could you have thrown this out of court because of yeah, uh, much as I'd like to, uh, as much as there are some maverick judges, no. Um, I mean, generally, it, it, it's a point that might go in the claimant's favour. Um, but that said, again, it's an interesting one. Because it's a policy, it doesn't have to be accepted by the claimant. Um, because ultimately, for each policy, I mean, you might introduce a policy at work next week that actually, I don't know, you're going to slightly change lunch breaks from 12 to 1 to 12.15 to 1.15 because it, it suits your schedule. That's a policy change, it's probably not a contractual change. Do you have to get agreement and acceptance? Do you have to get that change in writing from morning points? No, you don't. What you need to do is you need to communicate it to them and say this is what we're doing, and usually you need to give a reasonable meeting time. So you wouldn't say we're doing this today. Um, if it affects them in a significant way, you might say, well, we're going to do this in three months. If it's more minor, we're going to be doing this for a fortnight's time, etc. Or sometimes you just draw a line in the sand and say, for the avoidance of doubt, we're doing this forthwith. Um, so there is, there is a point about acceptance of policy, and it's a good point, and obviously, you know, you saw both sides of it, in that the employer was saying, you were sent it, you accept you were emailed it, yes, which is a really good point on the part of the employer, you accept it was your obligation to read that, because you were told you were to read it, and it was really important, yes, but from the employee side, but I've never actually read the detail of it, I was too busy. Employees were always too busy. It's, it's, I was having a chat with somebody at, uh, at the break, um, and, and this point of employees, oh, I didn't accept it, I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I didn't know, I was too busy, I didn't get time to. Um, funnily enough, every tribunal that I do where we're talking about any policy, every employee's been too busy to ever read the policy that we're referring to. Um, but on that, has the employer done enough? Ideally, they'd have it signed and it would be accepted, and then there's just no argument at all. Next best is probably an email and a red receipt. Um, next, and, and you go back in terms of your best practice and next best practice, but it is going to be a, a part of the decision. Um, but no, it's, it is a good point. But no, the judge won't kick the cat, the judge won't go halfway through. No, you've lost because of that. They will tend to wait till the end unless it's an absolute barnstorm of a It's never happened to me. It would be an absolute <laughs> barnstorm of a point that comes out halfway through. But no, they'll see it through to the end and then, and then make a decision. Yeah, I think cases are going to be thrown out. They, they are on occasions thrown out at preliminary hearings. Um, even that's pretty rare these days. But no, hard, they, I did want to make a submission of sort of halfway through, and it actually tried going through it out, and, and the claimant actually went, went off to the higher court, and the higher court, the employment appeal tribunal said, oh, they've got no business doing that halfway through, and we had to go back and do it all again. Yeah. And, and I've been in the same situation and made that submission and got told to shut up, sit down and carry on with the case. <laughs> <laughs> but, but overall it was better because we successfully defended the case and didn't have to go into the but, but for that very reason, the judge, judges don't like being appealed. I was just going to say, it's fine communicating it and that they've emailed it, but she's said that she's not read it and she's not signed a copy, so if you don't require a signed copy back, then the email shouldn't say that you need to sign it and send it back. You've done enough by communicating it. I agree. It would have been a lot. It would have been a lot more sensible if they didn't say that, because as you rightly say, if you actually say you need to show you're accepted of it, that it's it's poorly worded. It's deliberately poorly worded. I'll make clear. It's not a document that we set back to plan. We've deliberately used obtuse language. We've deliberately put points in like saying you accept this by. I mean, uh, it was about Christmas cover to think you, you confirm your acceptance to the privacy policy by signing this, it was quite deliberately done and she's not signed it, funnily enough, that might be part of the decision. But you're quite right, well picked up. Um, <clears throat> so they've created a rod for their own back by that. But it, it's Murphy's Law, I mean, I, 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 I certainly, not very long ago, um, did a sort of new handbook um, for a client who's got several thousand employees and there's a tariff sheet at the back saying, you know, I've read and I'll abide by this. Now the thing is, you know, yes, I mean, if nobody signs it, then you, then you chase them up. What do you do at the end of the day if you've got, you know, half a dozen who haven't signed it? It's very difficult because time is money and life is short. And, and you know, do you, do you keep banging away at these half a dozen forever? <coughs> um, or inevitably one of those half dozen is the one who gets sacked and doesn't <coughs> and brings a claim. But, you know, it's the art of the possible. Yes, it would be lovely if everybody signed it, 
But the reality of it is you're never going to get 100% buy-in. The best time, by the way, to get new policies through, to get new documents signed, for that, for that odd situation where you find, we were chatting about one in the car on the way over, that odd employee who, for whatever historical reason, hasn't got a contract, and you keep putting one in front of them and saying, would you mind signing it? And they keep saying, oh yeah, yeah, well, just, I've left it at home today. Yeah, I'm not ready yet. Yeah. Best time ever to get people to sign up to contracts? Yeah, pay increase. Pay increase time, absolutely, bang on. Yeah, we're here to talk about your pay increase, but it's really odd, I've not got a signed contract for you, so let's just do that bit first, <laughs> and then we'll have a conversation. Nice and easy, always pay review time. Absolutely. It works every time. It does work every time. Yeah. And you do it before you have the conversation, absolutely. because you then say, thank you ever so much, yeah, unfortunately this year. <laughs> The key term is review. Um, <laughs> sorry, the chat next to you had a question. Yeah, you said that he didn't sign the contract and you didn't, uh, the policy and didn't read it, but on the email, you always marked personal. So how would you know to write personal if you didn't read the policy? Who? My legal response to that in custom and practice. Actually, you raised it with me, but I said, My defense would be I'm a reasonable person, it was personal and private, I understand that, and that's had to be my argument all the way through. I think, that's why I'm actually personal. I think I, my, if I was trying to argue against that, my submission would probably be it's a bit far fetched to say, therefore, she must have read the policy because it's not an unheard of thing for people to want to mark things public mm. private if they want to mark it private. Yeah. Um, so my, I'd probably say that's quite far-fetched, but you know, you could try and persuade the judge that yeah, she probably knew about it if she wrote private. Yeah, I think it's a factual point. Um, it's a nice long argument. Yeah. Mm. Anything else? <laughs> Any questions about the evidence? Or or <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Okay. <laughs> I'll give you the decision, and we'll send it to you as well. Just <laughs> um, <coughs> because it's nice to. You. Okay. Um, for those of you who saw me tapping away, I was obviously um, I was obviously preparing this. Um, so the judgment of the tribunal is that the claimant in this case was unfairly dismissed, and yes, her claim for unfair dismissal succeeds. Well, she was dismissed for a fair reason, misconduct, in accordance with Section 98.2. Her dismissal wasn't fair in accordance with the Section 98.4 test, in that the respondent acted unreasonably as treating it as a sufficient reason to dismiss the claimant. Additionally, the claimant's uh, sub all, uh, second claim of breach of contract also succeeds, but for different reasons. So the reasons, I have to consider what was the principal reason for the dismissal, if misconduct was the reason for the dismissal, was the procedure fair in that did the respondent hold a genuine belief on reasonable grounds and was the investigation reasonable, and if so, did dismissal fall within a band of reasonable responses open to the respondent as a reasonable employer? So these were my factual findings that I made. Bear in mind, I can't substitute factual findings that the respondent has made. So the respondent's a relatively small academy, um, as an academy, it's independent from local authority control. It's clearly not a small employer, but has some resources and the ability to obtain human resources and legal support where necessary. Uh, the claimant was employed as a PA to the head teacher for about 13 years, and prior to the incident, had a clean disciplinary record. It was agreed that there were no disciplinary concerns with regard to the claimant or her work record before the issues in question. In January 2014, uh, the respondent's IT manager was asked to carry out an investigation by the head teacher, Mr. Dusak, into personal internet usage of the claimant, and I've been referred to the content of that investigation, which appears in its entirety to comprise of one email from Mr. Bug to Mr. Dusak, sent on the 29th of January, shown at pages 16 and 17. It's agreed evidence that on receipt of that email, Mr. Dusak requested the claimant to attend his office immediately, without notice and without further details, any question to the there's a note of that meeting, which appears to have been prepared shortly after that meeting, rather than at the meeting itself. Um, and for the most part, I accept the note is a fair record of what was discussed, and the claimant likewise accepts it as a fair record. Shortly after that meeting, Mr. Dusak took advice and suspended the claimant, and also invited the claimant to attend a disciplinary hearing. Within the invite letter, uh, which is in the bundle of 20 to 21, Mr. Dusak set out five allegations, which was that the claimant had sent and received an excessive number of personal emails, downloaded email attachments containing images of naked men and video clips, that she had accessed websites which contained pornographic images and, and participated in adult room chat rooms. It also alleged that, um, that the claimant had purchased adult items online from Anne Summers using the Academy computer 
your email address and have the items delivered to the Academy's office in breach of the uh, employee handbook. The claimant was invited to attend a disciplinary hearing. She wasn't. Uh, she attended that hearing on the 1st of February without accompaniment. I've considered the minutes of that disciplinary hearing at 22 to 24, which again are agreed, and they rec uh, I, I find that they represent an accurate portrayal of that meeting. At the conclusion of the hearing, Mr. Dusak adjourned for approximately one and a half hours before reconvening and dismissing the claimant. His decision was confirmed in writing on the 1st of February, and the claimant was offered a right of appeal, which she chose to exercise to a degree. The claimant specifically requested what she would describe as a paper review rather than attend an appeal hearing. The respondent accorded with that request, and Mr. Roger Stamper, Chair of Governors, considered the claimant's appeal and provided a written outcome on the 5th of February. Due to the limited nature of that appeal, Mr. Stamper has not attended to give evidence. However, the claimant has not challenged his actions within her evidence before the tribunal. So, looking at the law, both representatives again have helpfully summarised the law that I have to apply. The first matter is the reason for dismissal, and the respondent relies on section 982D in that conduct was the reason for the dismissal. The claimant concedes that this is the case, um, and I'm quite happy that that is the case. It is clear that the claimant was dismissed by reason of what Mr. Dusak believed was her misconduct. I then have to address the fairness of that dismissal, and both parties have referred me to similar authorities, Birchall British and British Home Stores and Iceland Frozen Food and Jones, which describes the band of reasonable responses. The other case law referred to by the parties has been useful, however, those cases are very much in place as guidance for the tribunal, and I must interpret the facts of the case as I find it in relation to those legal principles. However, as suggested by the claimant's representative, I've also got to take into account ACAS's code of practice um, in dealing with disciplinary procedures, and in particular, uh, the claimant's representative has referred me um, to paragraph four of that code of practice insofar as this relates to acting consistently, carrying out necessary investigations, and dealing reasonably with an employee accused of misconduct. So applying the law to the fact, it is not my place, and I reiterate, to make findings of fact in terms of what I believe the claimant did or did not do. I'm simply not entitled to do so. What is relevant is what the respondent reasonably found at the time to have occurred. That is what Mr. Dusak found occurred in that meeting of the 1st of February. I can't impose my own view or place myself in the position of the respondent. As it's only what the respondent considered at the time that is relevant, it must follow that the disclosure... Um, it is only what is what they thought that I must consider. And it's quite clear that the reason for the claimant's dismissal was conduct. It's clear that Mr. Dusak dismissed her for that reason and no other. So looking at the Birchall test, it is again clear that Mr. Dusak held a genuine belief that the claimant was guilty of that misconduct of which she was accused. What is less clear is whether or not Mr. Dusak had reasonable grounds upon which to form that genuine belief, which invariably leads me to consider the investigation conducted by the respondent. These two parts of that test sit side by side, and I'm going to consider them together. I'm wholly aware, again, I can't impose my own view of what a reasonable investigation should look like. Following the EAT's decision in Sainsbury's supermarkets and hits, the only test that I can apply to the respondent's investigation is that of a band of reasonable responses. That is to say, can I say that no reasonable employer would have investigated in the manner in which the respondent did? So looking at the investigation conducted by the respondent and the grounds that Mr. Dusak had in front of him at the time of the dismissal, I've got to consider, are those reasonable when viewed against that reasonable band? And I'm not persuaded that they are. The claimant contended that she was unaware of the respondent's IT policy. She wasn't signed it. She didn't sign it when it was emailed to her. Whilst it would clearly have been prudent for the respondent to have ensured that all employees signed and returned copies of an IT policy, what was accepted by the claimant was that this was emailed to her and she accepted that she could fail to comply with elements of it. It's clear that some of the claimant's actions were in breach or could be considered <coughs> as being in breach of this policy. However, I've got to restrict myself to the information the respondent had in front of it at the time. It's not correct to state that no further investigation was necessary, as Ms Morgan has suggested to me following the meeting, between the claimant and Mr. Dusak on the 29th of January. Whilst the claimant admitted to some of the allegations, she clearly did not do so in the terms with, it, through, with which the respondent subsequently labelled them. Additionally, whilst I'm only able to suggest that the investigation was unfair if it's outside of that band of responses, I believe that this is one of those rare occasions that I am able to state that any reasonable employer would have done more than this respondent did in this situation. In particular, the entire investigation appears to be one email sent by Mr. Bug on the 29th of January. The investigation focused exclusively on the claimant and the allegations relied purely on the use of such terms as reasonable usage. Despite this, the respondent has failed in any way to provide details of any other employee's usage or even to categorise what it itself considers to be reasonable personal usage. It is stranger still that the respondent did not consider imposing a warning on the claimant. 
It's also clear that the claimant's usage of her work email was outside of usual office hours and during her own personal time. That much is clear from the respondent's own investigation. Likewise, the claimant's accessing of websites was expressed within this investigation report to be outside of teaching hours. Whilst it was stated within the respondent's investigation that these sites contained pornographic content, there was no allegation or investigation into whether the claimant herself had actually accessed or viewed this content. In terms of ordering items from Anne Summers, again, the respondent places reliance upon a policy which, seems to its, which it seems to accept itself is simply not enforced against other members of staff. There was also evidence placed before the tribunal, although not raised by the claimant within her disciplinary hearing, of the head teacher, Mr. Dusak himself, breaching the respondent's IT policy. In these circumstances, I believe that the investigation conducted by the respondent was woefully inadequate and must fall outside of the bound of reasonable responses. For a similar reason, I also find Mr. Dusak did not have reasonable grounds in order to form his genuine belief that the, that the claimant was guilty of gross misconduct. In particular, in relation to the allegations, allegations 1 to 4 clearly occurred in the claimant's own time. Under the respondent's own policy, the claimant was allowed to use the internet and the email system in her own time. There was no investigation or evidence sought by the respondent in terms of what would constitute an excessive number, the respondent's word, of personal emails, and the email attachments were sent and received in the claimant's own time and clearly marked private or personal. In respect of allegation three, that the claimant had accessed websites from which contained pornographic images, there was no evidence whatsoever that the, that the claimant had viewed pornographic images, as the allegation suggested. On allegation four, again, the claimant had the right on any interpretation of the respondent's policy to participate in personal web use, and there was no prohibition against chat rooms in the respondent's procedures within the claimant's own time. Allegation 5 concerned the purchase and delivery of underwear to the respondent's premises. Now, whilst a policy prohibiting such a practice existed, it is clear that this policy was not brought to the attention of the claimant, and it was specifically raised and conceded by the <coughs> respondent that this policy wasn't enforced and was encouraged by a number of the respondent's staff without any consequence whatsoever, let alone the ultimate sanction of dismissal. It's unnecessary to deal with the point, however, for the sake of completeness, the decision to dismiss the claimant for her actions, I believe, would fall outside of a band of reasonable responses. Mindful that this was an employee with over 13 years unblemished service with the respondent, only the most serious act or acts of misconduct would be likely to sufficient to, be, to justify a summary dismissal without any earlier warning whatsoever. Even at its highest, I'm not sure that this is such a case. However, mindful of the issues of apparent inconsistency, <coughs> some, although not all, were flagged by the claimant during the disciplinary process, I'm able to say comfortably that dismissal falls outside of a band of reasonable responses open to the Academy. For this reason, I've got to find the claimant's dismissal unfair. Her claims therefore succeed, and a hearing will be listed with the parties in order to determine the appropriate remedy. It is, of course, obviously still open to the respondent to make an argument of contributory faults or a pulky reduction from the compensatory award. That is to say that whilst the process may have been unfair, the same outcome would have resulted because of the claimant's own actions, which I have already found to be misconduct. In terms of the breach of contract claim, it's up to the tribunal to determine whether objectively viewed the claimant's conduct was so serious so as to amount to a fundamental breach of her contract. And for the reasons that I've already set out, I don't find that her conduct was so serious. And again, for this reason, I must conclude that her claim for breach of contract for her contractual notice period must succeed. I want to thank both representatives for the helpful way which they presented the case, the effective cross-examination of witnesses and their helpful submissions that made my job an awful lot easier. I'd also like to thank Siobhan for stepping in at the last second when, um, when the original <laughs> claimant was ill this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and that concludes the tribunal's judgment. Yes. Sorry, can I just make one other point? Um, for most people, sat listening to that, there's a lot of legal complexity there. there yeah? and, and for line managers and for business owners, it can be quite problematical. The, the tip I try to give people faced with situations in my mind, as part of the process, just pause and just spend a minute standing in the shoes of the person that you're dealing with. And actually, if you do that, then there may be other aspects that you need to think about that as the employee you just haven't considered. Yeah, you're quite right. I you know, know. Just look at it from both sides, really. I was going to say, strip, stripping out the legal elements, yeah, there's yeah. three key points. Policies. <clears throat> Get it to all staff. Acceptance if you can, but ensure it's communicated in the most effective way and ensure that you can demonstrate that it has been sent to employees and they've been told it is coming into force and they need to read it. The best thing is always to have it signed, as has been pointed out already. If you do have a policy in place, follow it for goodness sake. Where I've criticised the respondent particularly is where it has a policy and it just hasn't done anything about that policy. And follow it consistently. 
So again, if you say, thou must not do that, if employees don't do that, you need to take action. I'm not saying you have to dismiss them, but you should be taking action to at least remind them of that and make clear that further breach, even if you do it in an informal basis, record that you dealt with it on an informal basis, and warn that further repetition might lead to warnings or even dismissal if so serious. Investigations, follow-up leads. So in the hearing, when the employee says, lots of people do this, in fact, I can give you the names of three other people who've done this, don't say, well, I'm not interested, I'm only talking about you. Break off the disciplinary hearing, investigate those, and again, either distinguish those. I've got a case at the moment where that's happened, and they've said, well, actually, there's a number of employees, and we've said who, and they've said, these 14 people. <laughs> So we've gone away and we've checked the circumstances of all 14 people and do you know what? They're not the same situation. These employees have refused, or this employee has refused to do a job. Those 14 people have stopped doing the job, or that bit of the job. Yes, that's because four of them were pregnant and couldn't do that element of the job because it was a very physical element. Two of them were disabled and therefore couldn't do it. And the remainder had all asked their manager whether they could stop doing it and their manager agreed to vary their roles. And that's very different from saying, I'm not doing this job, show it up your backside which was roughly what had been said. So we were, but on that case, we were able to investigate, come back, clearly distinguish all 14 cases, and, what I hope, fairly dismiss them, as opposed to a situation where you say, oh, it's just you, in which case they've got 14 inconsistency arguments that they can raise, which bear in mind, in this case, we didn't find it was an inconsistency argument, but we did find, because of those inconsistency points raised, they failed to properly investigate, which is a, a, a secondary point. Um, and again, disciplinary allegations. Again, they've not taken particular care in this case about the allegations. They've put allegations without thinking about them. So they've said, you've done such and such. You know, you've, you've looked at, you've got excessive email usage. Well, what constitutes your excessive usage? It might not be in the policy. It might be reasonable. You might have to give evidence, but at least come up with what you define reasonable is. Ask the employer on the investigation what they think reasonable is. Do you think reasonable means 20 personal emails a day? And they might say yes, in which case you go and look and you average out for an average team and actually no. Most people send two or three or even four or five. 20 does seem excessive, but it's probably a warning situation in the first instance. Evidence it and apply it consistently. Consistency is a biggie in tribunals. Um, so again, apply your policies consistently. If you've got a policy in place, Bothered. But yeah, you're quite right. I did do it in a lot of legal language, and those were those were the points I had in English, um, <laughs> rather than that. Has anyone else got anything they'd like to ask? There, there is some very nice smelling food that I should have. <laughs> we're obviously back for the next 20 minutes, half hour if you want to have a chat to one of us individual. But thank you very much for coming.